Shut up and sit down. All right, I'm just going to get right into it. Beardo, you need to be more excited when you say that this time. You have been trying for this. I've been doing broadcasting, or at least what I like to think is broadcasting, for the last four or five years. And when I get a guest that I have been trying for, that I have been waiting for, that I would say begging for, I would do something like this. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so excited tonight. I am now joined by someone who is just a beacon of hope. Someone who you just smile when you see him, even though he's got the grouchiest puss that I've known for over 12, maybe even 13 years. He is the one, the only. He may not have long hair anymore, but he still has that smile. The legendary bow to his greatness, the pit boss, Ken Knapsack. Yeah, I guess I'm okay. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Are you excited to yeah, be here? Let's just get right into it. Yeah. Is Christian going to be here? He's going to do no, all no, He's going to he, answer on your great, behalf. Though. You yeah. should take some notes from him. I, I don't like doing those intros. I'm just what? not good at it. I don't know how you do it on your podcast. You do yeah, that sure. whole thing. But what? G- give, try it. Try, try it once. Try what? Th- Just try it. Like, give me your best radio voice. I don't have one where it says, hey, uh, welcome to episode something of the uh, Don't Be Weirdo podcast with my special guest, Ken Knapsack. Yeah, that sounds good. Why can't yeah. you do that? Because I like to have it like conversational. And, we can get into a conversation. But I don't, like when I'm in a conversation, I don't introduce people like that. Right. So I do at parties. Yeah. Oh, you do? Yeah. And you have like little note cards of yeah. like how to, what to bring up and everything? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Welcome this guy. He's one of the writers on a project you never heard about developed with me. Here's my friend, Matthew Ryan Key. So, so you do, how long have you been in broadcasting? No, uh, I, I was out of it for a long time, but I started in um, uh, 1994. Yeah. Did you want to just be a radio DJ? Not yes, yes, I did. Um, I there's tapes that my father has of when he was about three, when I was three years old, not him, when he yeah. I was three, yeah, and he got some old reel to reel and some microphones, and we recorded stuff and we did stories, mm-hmm. we'd improv stories, and so then uh, 10, 11, 12 range, um, I had like a big boom box, like a plastic, like Tyco type of boombox and I'd record shows on there and I'd interview my sister she'd be my guest and and I would just it was like a fix it show it's like this guy who was like oh I'll fix your uh, washer and dryer because like I, that, I would just pretend to do it I know and to this day I can't fix anything <laughs> you created a character like yeah, this whole character. persona yeah, yeah it was a persona yeah, yeah. I, it would interview my sister and then I'd I'd go and I'd have commercials and I'd go into the kitchen and be like we're brought, brought to you by bologna sandwich and like I don't I, those tapes don't exist how, how did this come up though like did, were you watching TV and you're like hey I want to do that um, no 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 I don't know exactly that's the mystical thing about it I, I don't know where it started I didn't listen to a lot of radio. I listened mm-hmm. to some. Uh, I didn't really get into music till like junior high. Then I'd start listening to morning shows and stuff and, and understood that concept. Mm-hmm. Uh, but other than that, I'd, it just kind of was there, man. Your father in in, in radio? No, or? he's an engineer. No, oh, yeah? he, he's an engineer. Very quiet, shy guy. Funny. Yeah. He was an artist. Yeah. Uh, do two D drawings and 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 stuff like that. Um, my mom's very outspoken and. Uh, uh, kind of a, an extrovert, but I am not. I'm more my father. But but when it comes to performing, I'm more on my mother's side. She did drama and all that stuff. Oh, okay. So you can flip that switch and turn on the broadcasting. It's and... absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely. It's it's a uh, it's me, but it's a persona. And so then, like like ninth grade, I used to record my own radio shows with two boom boxes uh-huh. and I'd play music and record it with a microphone holding up to the box. And I'd be like, all right, there that's you two mysterious ways. And then I, I, I had characters and I'd interview myself over and over as, as uh, as my own guests. Wow, you're a one man yeah. show. One man show. In like your own room, basement area? Uh, my bedroom. Yeah, I yeah, didn't yeah. leave my bedroom much as a kid. <laughs> you that and baseball. But were you time. were you very popular? Or you no. Didn't that, you didn't have any friends? No, so you no, created would, your own friends? Yeah, I had friends and I was probably more liked than I knew, which is a, a theme for my life, but I, I was not a popular kid. No, I was definitely. Um, but then, like, every time, like, I was the nerd, the picked upon nerd. I was, I was you know, bullied in, in, in elementary school and everything. Were you a small kid? Yeah, I've always been s- like smaller. A rent, yeah, rent. yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I yeah, graduated yeah. high school like 150 pounds. That's not bad. It's not bad, yeah, but yeah. when you look at me now and I'm like 210, <laughs> like it's it's bad. Um, so yeah, so I, but but then I be because of my performance, like in seventh grade, mm-hmm. was not I was a picked upon nerd, but I was in drama, and then eighth grade, 
as one of the stars of the drama department, I was the popular kids took notice of me. Mm -hmm. And then in the high school, when you get to bigger waters, ninth, 10th, 11th grade, same type of thing. I was kind of like under the radar senior year. Like I had people like, when you get famous, can I be on your show? None of them have been on my show, Beardo. <laughs> oh, wait, they, they said that? They thought yeah. you were going to go yeah, to yeah. like Hollywood and be a famous yeah, yeah. like performer and everything? Yeah, and I thought I was going to be on Saturday Night Live like a lot of kids yeah, uh, yeah. of my generation, of my ilk. Um, and so there was that. I, I told everyone I was going to be a stand-up comic and, and all that kind of stuff. When, yeah. when did you start? When did you get into SNL? Uh, what were your 89, years? 1989. Who, who was, who was that cast? That was the, that was the Dana Carvey, Phil Hartman, Mike Myers was still young, Jan Hooks, Victoria Jackson, Nora Dunn, Kevin uh, Nealon, A. Whitney Brown, Al Franken, uh, that, who was Dennis that? Miller, of course. He was the Weekend Update? He was Update, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, and that was my era. So it was right after the 89-90 season, I think I didn't really watch as much. So, so you watched when they like revamped when like Lauren Michaels came back. And... No, he came back in eighty five. Oh, okay, eighty five, oh, eighty five, years... eighty. Yeah, but I was familiar with that a little bit. Then I immediately would watch on Comedy Central, or for a while it was called Ha, a different comedy oh, network. It, it, was comedy... Ha. it was called Ha. It was just called Ha. Called ha with an exclamation point, uh -huh. and then it switched to Comedy Central at one uh -huh. point. Uh, I would watch reruns, and then my friends and I really got into it, and that's when I became kind of a Saturday Night Live, you know aficionado where yeah. you, know, you and I have had great conversations about yeah. and, oh, 83 Tim <laughs> Kazarinski came in uh, I'm slipping a little bit there now but but yeah that was so 88 eight, eight, 89 90 that was the year with like Damon Wayans and Ben Stiller on for little cups of coffee uh, all that kind of stuff I didn't really watch that year it was the next year I really picked and up. how old are you then middle school high school middle school yeah so you're talking 89 I'd be 13 so okay so 13 year old you're like I'm gonna SNL is my dream now yeah that was yeah. me and my friends I used to I used to do book reports in eighth grade yeah as Dennis Miller so I'd get up in front of class I'd pull a desk up and we got to perform and I'd sit down and be like, Robert Louis Stevenson was coming up off the island here. Meh, meh, meh. And I just make all these references I didn't understand yeah, do, yeah. doing Dennis Miller. Yeah. And so as 13 year old, like you understood his his comedy. Or, got it. Yeah. yeah. I was a very, very, I don't consider myself too smart, but I was pop culture smart early on. Yeah. So I'd be 13 talking to my friend's dad about Procol Harum songs. <laughs> I don't and know. Wider, wider Shade of Pale, that song by Pork and Pork. And he'd be like, how do you know that? I'd be yeah, like, yeah. oh, yeah. And what about Eric Burden and War? And he'd be like, what are you, like, you know, so I, I was just, I got Dennis Miller in that but, way. So how did you come up with, like, these pop culture, like, or come up with this knowledge of pop culture? Was it, like, your father? Or was, did you no, have an older brother? In no, any? no, no, no. I'm an, I'm the older brother. I have a younger sister, four years younger. My mom and dad, I was, you know, I, I've joked on Schmoes, raised a... Uh, a very tight conservative Christian family. So I wasn't allowed to watch a lot of things. Um, uh -huh. But stuff got through. I did not go to a, a Christian school, went to a public school. So, uh -huh. so I had garbage pail kids. <laughs> I had muscles. I had G.I. Joe's Transformers and Mask and all that stuff and Robotech. Um, so I had some, some, some stuff would get through. My parents yeah. did let me be a parent, uh, kid. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just, in 1987, I call 1987 the year of my pop culture awakening. And I think we all have that at some point. You'll find in your life, if you, if you look back, you probably can pinpoint a year yeah. where you're like, I'm a little kid. Oh, I understand what the World Series means, the history of it. Mm. Not just like for me in 85, I remember watching the Cardinals and Royals play. I didn't know what I was watching. But uh -huh. in 87, I knew the Twins and Cardinals were the number, you know, were the World Series. And this was a thing that had history and I could study it. Oh, so that's what you mean by like pop culture? A pop like, culture awakening yeah. where 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 one you're you're listening to Goosebumps uh, songs or something and the next week, week you're like, Mom, can I buy a Michael Jackson cassette? Like, uh -huh. That's it's a pop culture, and '87 was my pop culture awakening. Yeah. And okay, so the dream is SNL, and then where are you? Are you from the East Coast? I was born in the city of Orange and raised in um, Arroyo Grande, California, which is near Pismo Beach. It's all one. It's called the Five Cities. Well, you're from Orange County, City of Orange. Yeah, born in the city of Orange. Wow. Yeah. Do yeah. you know where Chino Hills or Walnut is? I, I absolutely know where it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, uh, never been there. I never. I, I passed through the <laughs> the Inland Empire and that kind of stuff. You know, I've got, been out to Beaumont, California. There's a big pile of dirt with a flag on it. Um, been to Corona to drink some beers with Cody Hall. Not, yeah, yeah. Nah, perform, no, yeah. perform comedy out there. Uh, uh, yeah, but I was seven when we moved up from there. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm from Walnut. That's where I'm from. Okay. from yeah, yeah. I thought you're, for, for some reason, I thought you were East Coast. No, people always think I'm from New York, but I, I don't. No? Maybe it's like the style that you style. are? Style. I was, I was told early on, oh, you should go to New York. You'd love it there. You'd fit in. And I did not go to New York until 2015, my first time. Oh, so and, I, and I immediately, oh, I know what people are talking about. This feels like home. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I, it's a weird, I don't, I don't understand it. So you didn't follow through with the SNL dream of like moving to New York? 
mm-hmm. like starting an improv? I, I started. I, I went down. That's why I moved to LA. I thought, oh, a lot of people have heard now. Like I talked about Josh McCougar's show probably most open uh, openly that I, I decided after high school. There's a lot of things I wanted to to do. I wanted to be a baseball announcer. Uh-huh. I thought about going to Syracuse to study announcing. Uh, broadcasting. Uh, I wanted to be a professional wrestler or a professor, a professional wrestling manager. Mm-hmm. And my friend Joel Trudgeon and I, who actually is now a, a teacher down here at CSUN in screenwriting, and um, wait, what's his name? Joel. Joel Trudgeon. Oh. Uh, he also works at Valley College if you're in the LA area. Because I, I went to CSUN, I had a teacher. I, I don't think mm. that's not his name. I don't think no, yeah. it's recent. Um, uh, and we moved to LA together, but we wanted to be in pro- professional wrestling for a yeah. while, so we used to have our own front yard wrestling <laughs> league and all that stuff. Um, that didn't come through because I didn't, you know, as a tiny at the time. I was too tiny to be a wrestler. Now I could probably have done it, but I'm I'm not athletic. So when when did that come into play? When when you like started getting into wrestling? Oh, I was a wrestling fan as a kid. Yeah, yeah. from early on. Like so, strictly WWF, WWF, classic WWF yeah. and NWA and all that stuff. And my dad was he had watched it in the fifties and everything and 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 sixties. And so mm-hmm. he he kind of liked it and would encourage it and it was fun. Mm-hmm. And then he and my uncle Nick, my late uncle Nick, they kind of let me in on the on the uh, on the gimmick there. Let me in on the work. And and when I found out it was quote unquote fake, I was I was pulled out. I was like, oh, I was just, I'm not watching this. Oh, you stopped? Stopped. Yeah, and yeah. then about two years later, I was watching on a Saturday morning. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the British Bulldog, David Boy Smith, had recently returned to the WWF. And um, I had remembered him as one of my favorite tag teams, he and da- uh, Dynamite uh, Dynamite Kid. So I started watching again, and I haven't stopped. Yeah. Oh, you haven't stopped since then? I haven't stopped what? since then. Yeah, yeah. So did you think you were like into too many things where you couldn't just pinpoint one thing um, and follow through with it? I am now. What? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no. I had my focuses. Um, Star Wars, of course. Um, uh, wrestling, baseball, baseball. What's weird is you guys know me now. I, I don't think people. I think people would look at Mark and Makuga as the sports guys on Schmoes. Yeah. Um. I, there was a yeah. time you could not be if there was movie trivia Schmodown was a baseball trivia Schmodown. Probably even now I'd I'd win. Yeah. Uh, the last ten years would be fuzzy, even <laughs> though I still watch and I'm still in fantasy baseball leagues and all that stuff. I mean. I when I say I was either in my room recording radio shows or I was just reading books on baseball history. Oh, so you so you're into baseball? You didn't play baseball? I, I tried to play again. Yeah. I don't have the athletic skills. I have the baseball mind. I ended up being a baseball coach. Oh yeah, yeah. and actually led a team of uh, young uh, young uh, young future gentlemen to a, a title. Yeah, and before I moved to L, uh, L.A., so about 1998. Yeah, um, I was a major uh, major. Uh, uh, little league baseball coach and and uh it was so, I was so so good at it i was asked to be the commissioner of the league at well, 22 and what would you say i was already moving oh you were already like i was already set to go when, yeah. did, when did you move to la uh august of 1998 and you were how old 22 so so where, did you go to college i started to go to junior college uh-huh. uh, which is alan hancock community college in santa maria california and I was studying film production and screenwriting, and I wanted to be a director at the time. Again, again, you're right, <laughs> you, though. You have a lot so of different things. things. Yeah, yeah. And I uh, thought that's because I, I really got into writing, you know. So mm. I like that angle. And um, I like the idea of directing, you know, if that sounded yeah. like George Lucas, you know what I mean? I'm oh, going to yeah. be like that. So you, Star Wars was your awakening as well? Yeah, Star Wars was the first time I was moved by a story. Well, E.T., I will give E.T. credit. Oh, yeah. E.T. was one of the first times I saw that in theater and was like, I moved, inspired, uh-huh. frightened. Yeah. You know, uh, so all that, the emotions. Have to give that a lot of credit. So that was one, another reason where you're like, hey, I want to get into this directing thing. Yeah. Yeah. And storytelling. And um, I'll be blunt, like I started studying and, and it's just, I don't want to say too much work, but it's, it's you know, production. You know yeah. what I mean? These guys. And I, I hate being on sets. Oh, you do? I don't like being on sets. I was talking to some people around here because, you know, Collider with Awesome Tacular, we do a lot of on-location shoots now. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And I was like, I didn't sign up for this. Oh, you, <laughs> you, don't, you don't like going, like, on location on I sets? I any- sets what? are boring. Oh, they're boring they're to you? They're boring. It's not creative. It's, uh, it's I'm the type that's like, set up the camera. I don't get the light. It's not, get, put your light meter away. Uh-huh. Let's just shoot. <laughs> and... Oh, because I, yeah. I think Seinfeld talked about it, too, where he, he likes doing stand-up because of that, mm-hmm. that, uh, connection with the audience when he did yep. a, when he did a, did a movie he doesn't know if anything's funny right because he's on a set it's, it's like, an editing it's an art form i love people that, that love it uh i totally get the appeal to it for other people it's not uh-huh. me and so i was at 1994 i graduated uh-huh. high school in 94 so 94 95 my first year of college uh-huh. um i was really starting to focus on like oh, that'll that'll be a path and my friend my friend joel he uh-huh. was going there too and we were he ended up going to csun transferring down as a student uh i just didn't like it and then at the time, I needed uh, to get uh, I needed to get some credit uh-huh. for college for an in, for a class for work experience class. So 
we had started working at a local live TV station, uh, a UHF station in, in Napomo, California, my friends and I. And the two morning show guys from K Bear 95, Freddie B and John Mackey, were the hosts of the Tuesday show. It was a live show. Yeah. And I used, I started hosting the Thursday night show. So I was 18 years old. I had my, my own show. I have tapes of it. Yeah. It's horrible stuff. Maybe I'll bring it out for you guys. I had long hair. I was growing my hair out after high school. And I was trying to be like Letterman. It was horrible stuff. <laughs> oh, Letterman's your guy? That's the Letterman's guy. Letterman's my guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just kind of, I so I ended up bothering these these two guys, John and Freddie. Like, could I intern at the radio station? And my friend Matt. Yeah. Uh, joined me because we were in the same class and we started interning mm -hmm. and at the same time we started working met Matt and I and our friend Gavin started working and then my, later my friend Joel started working at a micro powered radio station in Grover Beach California called 88.9 mm -hmm. and uh, that you know pirate radio essentially but yeah. micro broadcasting and every Friday we had a six hour show Whoa. and we were just on air for six hours and was that a lot of fun and or that, was that, that stressful? Was, that was great. And yeah, it was yeah. fun. And we'd play music and, and all kind of stuff. But we had a six hour show. And we had a lot of fun. And so I started interning at the radio station. And I started getting on air. I started, I started doing faking phone calls. Yeah, yeah. The program director would turn to me and be like, hey, we need a caller for these tickets. Just go pretend like I'll take your call. I'm not going to give you the tickets. And that'll cause people to start calling in. So I'd go in yeah. the other room, get online, pretend to be a caller. And then I would be funny, make them laugh. And then so he started giving me little things to do. And then I got a weekend shift and they hired me and I was a weekend graveyard DJ at wow. this rock station, KB95. And then I um, started delivering the sports and music news and I would do it with Bret Hart's theme in the background. <laughs> yeah. And that's how I started. That was the first time I started doing it. That was 95, 96. Right? So you had no training. You just jumped right into no, it? No, I didn't. Yeah, I went to school for other things and uh -huh. then just had this, I just had the radio job. And then so I got hired full time mm -hmm. and... Uh, it was just one of those things where it was like, I, I, I hate to say it, you know, kids go to school, Yeah. but, but I never have had really like formal education. Uh, and I was in, I was in all the gifted classes in school, in yeah, elementary yeah. school. Mm -hmm. I was pulled out and put on all these gifted classes and all this stuff. And I hated it. You hated the gifted class? I classes? hated, I hated just, I hate formal education for me. You out there, some people love it. I, I had yeah. a girlfriend that was like getting her master's and she still wanted to go after that to get her doctor. She's like, I, yeah. I could go to school my entire life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wanted out of it so fast. Not because I had a bad social experience. Yeah, yeah. I still to this day, I mean, that's probably why I love doing more of this broadcasting stuff because, you know, a movie talk, for instance, mm -hmm. God bless these people, Perry, <laughs> uh, uh, Mark, all this, they prepare notes. They'll come to movie talk with six pages of notes. Yeah. And I'm like, I'll figure it out when I get there. That's not you. You don't like to prepare? Don't like to prepare. So when you had that six hour show on Friday, we, during, didn't, we didn't prepare. You didn't prepare anything. No. Nah, How do you fill in six hours without? We, we us, man. <laughs> our, it didn't always work. Yeah, yeah. We had to learn. And that's part of the, that was part of the education. Oh, okay. Is learning. And same with our, and so eventually my friend Matt, Matt Donovan, Matty D, was his own air name. We got the morning show. So we're 20 years old. Uh -huh. And the, there were some changes in the station. And if if some of the, there was some bigger stuff going on, I think another circumstance we wouldn't have gotten the show, but we got it. So at 20 years of age, we we are at a reporting radio station with our own morning show. Reporting yeah. being, it, we were at an official station that reported to record companies and everything. In so, in Los Angeles? Uh, no, in, in Arroyo Grande, in, where, Pis in Pismo Beach. Oh, so, where is, like how far out is, where is so that? That's three hours north. Oh, okay. Right on the Central Coast. You know, I don't know Santa, why... you know where Santa Barbara is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hour and a half north of that. Oh, okay. And and that was it. So we learned that way. Mm -hmm. And we did, like, there were some mornings we sucked. <laughs> there were some mornings. Uh, the show started at 6 a.m. Matt would roll in at, like, 5. Yeah, yeah. I'd roll in at 5.58. And <laughs> so you, just, like, let's do it. You're that guy that doesn't prepare. You don't... Yeah. And it's... it's. I, I, I hope it doesn't annoy other people. It doesn't... Like, Inside Schmodown, if you watch, I've never had, ever had one word prepared. Uh-huh. Um, I just, that's, that's what I like to do. You don't freeze up or no. think, Hey, like, what if I didn't, what if I forget to bring this up yeah, or I'll don't make mention notes that? on the way? That's why yeah. sometimes you'll see inside Schmo in particularly, or even on Schmo's, I have notes Oh yeah, going on. Yeah. 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 But I, yeah. Yeah. So I, so it's not necessarily a great thing. Uh -huh. So that's why I ended up fit. I didn't drop out of college, but I finished my two years. Mm hmm uh, did not do any of my general education. It's like, <laughs> screw that. Um, Just did the classes you wanted to do. Did the classes I wanted and got yeah. my certificate in film and video production. Mm. And I don't even have it. I didn't even go to the office to pick it up. Yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd started my radio career. And I thought, this is it. I found it. Because this, going back to, that's what I wanted to do at three. Yeah. Three years of age, I'm talking into microphones. Yeah. yeah. My dad and I talking, telling stories for 30 minutes with no preparation, no script. I was three, for gosh sake. So I think that all connects up.
So that's what you were, you felt like you were born to do that. Born to do that. Yeah. But then jobs turned to jobs and yeah. I, I didn't, I, I, you don't like doing the nine to five jobs. It, no, I'm okay with the radio is fine. I'm like, I was six to 10, six uh -huh. to 10 every day. And then I get off and I had all the, I could have gone back to school. I could have done a lot of things. I uh -huh. just would go play tennis with my friend. Uh -huh. And then it started, to, I started to get bored. It's my hometown. Uh -huh. So you get bored in your hometown, you're tiny. It was a tiny town. And then that's where the other dream, because I knew I couldn't be a baseball player anymore. And I, <laughs> professional wrestling didn't seem like that was going to work out. Um, didn't even really try. Um, yeah. And then I, uh, I, my other love of Saturday Night Live focused back in. I was like, I want to go to LA and, and try to go to the Groundlings. Oh, so then that's when that. you started a career there or yeah. started so working I wasn't there? My biggest regret, I wasn't focused on radio. Mm -hmm. I could have been, had a lot bigger. I could have gone another place. But it feels like you are focused in that. You just get bored easily. I do get bored easily. Which yeah. is a, it's a problem. <laughs> um, so yeah, so uh, about 98, uh, I got laid off in the radio station. Uh -huh. They changed formats, dumped the whole... Um, whole staff and went to voice tracking and everything where the DJs come in and record on Mondays and that's their whole just, week. Oh, just play it through. Yeah. And so, so then what ended up happening is, uh, I was going down to see Oasis in concert uh -huh. and my friend Joel was going to see Sun. So me and my other friend uh, went down and I decided I'm going to move. Uh -huh. I'm going to move. And that's what I did. And, uh, it took me a couple months, but where, yeah. where'd you move to? Northridge. You moved to the Valley. Uh, yeah. Granada Hills. Actually. Yeah. 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 Oh, so you're still kind of like 30 minutes outside of like the city of LA. Yeah, yeah. For those not familiar, San Fernando Valley. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just north of uh, Hollywood. So did, did you don't seem like the type to like save up money? You seem, you seem like. <laughs> Why do you say that? Because you just like jump right into things. You don't prepare. You don't bring notes. You don't get up at five. I mean, you're you're right. Yeah, you're right, Beardo. <laughs> but um, yeah, so, I've always had trouble saving money. <laughs> Well, it wasn't like a financial thing. It was just saying like, but no, you just jump but, into but things. That, but that's, that's, that's insightful. And I'll give you credit for that. And that's why you're good at interviewing. And despite what people think I, uh, I, I think about you online, you, you're, you're damn good at this. Um, Thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, <laughs> that's been a problem with me. So you just jumped right into it. And then what did you do for work? What did you do? Uh, did first, you... I started, I was, I lost my radio job uh -huh. and I got a job at the local movie theater with all my friends that had been working for years. And I uh -huh. came in and I worked in a movie theater. One of my favorite jobs in all the world is cleaning movie theaters. It's relaxing. No one's around. You just sweep up everyone's trash. Really? And why, why a shitty song plays uh, <laughs> on, on the, uh, on the, um, over on the speakers there. Yeah, yeah. And I love that. So I transferred down to the Man 9 Granada Hills, which is on uh, Devonshire, no, Balboa and uh, Roscoe, I think. I think I saw a movie. I think I saw a Looper there. My, if yeah. there's a Man 9 Granada Hills. And yeah. Man has since changed. I think Man, Man was Man Theaters. And uh -huh. I think they're gone. I worked there. And then for two months, I was working for two months, making $5 an hour. Yeah, yeah. Living with three other guys in Granada Hills. And then that's when my uncle, retired police officer, was like, hey, I'm working security over this mall. I'm the security director. I want you to work for me. And I was like, all right, cool. Oh, so that's where you got into like a security job. Yeah, yeah. Because one of the other jobs I wanted to do growing up was be a police officer. <laughs> and in uh, 92, 93, I actually started that process too, called my uncle, said I think he was, he still is, he's between active and reserves he does in his past his 50th year in lapd whoa and so i talked to him and he said here's what you got to do and here's the courses you got to go take criminal justice but also business and all this other kind of stuff uh -huh. and uh again preparation and stuff i was like, <laughs> like I'm no just, i'm just gonna go tell jokes <laughs> so 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 when you when you were working at the movie theater is that when you were going to groundlings no, I just, um, I was starting to prepare. I was scared. I was, a, I'm a very shy guy, very uh -huh. socially awkward. I'm better now, but I had trouble leaving my apartment. Like, Were you, not, not quite agoraphobia, but, but I, I, it was like, terrifying. Just like anxiety, like going just outside. Of, if I'm not on stage or in front of a microphone controlling things, I'm usually awkward. Yeah, People yeah. see me at parties. I can't tell you how many times you may have seen me at parties. You yeah. come up to me like, are you okay? <laughs> and I'm like, I'm totally fine. Yeah, but yeah. like, you haven't said a word. You're in the corner. Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm good. Do you do the thing where like you don't say you don't say bye to anybody? You just leave. Uh, I'll say bye. Yeah. Sometimes Irish goodbyes are okay. Yeah, yeah. I'm okay with that. Because I like everything. I'm awkward too. Like I'm more comfortable in a microphone talking yeah. to you because I'm controlling the conversation mm -hmm. because I'm asking whatever whenever I want to ask. Yeah. In a social situation, I can't really small talk. Can't really bring up right. what's going on in the world. And it's like I, I'm pretty nice person, but I also sometimes just don't care at a party. <laughs> Like, hi, I'm so-and-so. I don't care. Yeah, I don't care. Like, <laughs> I don't care. Like, people come with their credits and like, hey, I was on yeah, this yeah, show. Yeah, I just yeah. came from a meeting. It's like, I don't give I a don't shit. Care. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, Even that. But but um, when I become friends with you, I'm friends with you. And I, yeah. and I open up and, and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, so yeah, that's why. So I didn't start right away, but the ground leans a uh, couple months into it. Jan January 99, I started. 
so the training, training there. Yeah. Um, so why was the Groundlings your choice? Because you you heard like I, uh, I Dana was, Carvey or he, no no he 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 wasn't he came from more stand up. Um, oh yeah, yeah. It was uh, so obviously Second City Chicago. Yeah yeah. Which at the same time would have been Second City Detroit or Toronto. And I was obsessed with going to Canada. I was a big fan of Kids in the Hall growing up. Yeah yeah. Um, almost as much as SNL at one point. And so I, th- yeah, I thought of going to Canada wow. and Second City Toronto was on the list there too. And then just a little bit of um, the idea of going to LA three hours away. My friends lived there. My fam- my uncles, two uncles were there. Mm. And my mom and dad were three hours away. I was like, I, I think I'm going to go to LA, <laughs> not Chicago. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was a choice. Then you go to Groundlings and what do you learn? Like all, That's all improv or is that like character based? Uh, it's character based. They, they fo- try to focus a lot on acting. There was, they've, they've changed some of the stuff over the years, but in the late 90s, early 2000s, they wanted less funny wigs and makeup and they wanted more character based stuff. Mm. Uh, which is funny because then you see Will Ferrell and sometimes he's just screaming like a madman. Yeah, yeah. And I love Will. Um, <laughs> but uh, there's a lot of writing. That's Groundlings is best for sketch writing. Yeah, I think. And then other places like UCB and Improv Olympic West and uh, even Second City LA sometimes is not the best. But that's more better for improv, like actual long form improv. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I'm pretty good. At, I'm pretty good improviser, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, Oh, I got. I, I like. Uh, I like writing a good sketch. Yeah. So, so when you get to the groundlings, you're like, are you thinking like, this is what I want to do? This is the path I need yes, to take to get I, to. SNL? I was stupid. I was like, this is gonna do this for a couple of years. Get on the main company. Get on Sunday company. Get on the main company, and I'll be on Saturday Live in like four years. <laughs> so, so what was the what was the reality on that? Reality was I breezed past the first two levels. Now, groundlings at the time, and I think it still is divided in like four levels of training. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first two levels, I breezed through it, and uh, I'll tell you, Beardo, uh, I was the best in the class. Yeah, yeah. both classes. Superstar. Not, not bullshitting. You were not actually good. So you were comfortable. You were you, good at this. You, my my teachers Chase Winton and Tim Bagley will tell you. But yeah, yeah. I was the I was the best in the class. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also usually groundlings there's long waiting periods between classes. Yeah. But I did. I had two weeks between classes. So I just thought it's like a rookie who comes up to Major League Baseball and everyone's throwing him fastballs and he's hitting home runs. He's like, this is great. And someone throws the curveball for the first time and his yeah. knees buckle. Um, then I got the third level and the talent talent was was better. Yeah. And I still did great. Uh-huh. But talent was better. A guy named Andrew Friedman, who's been on the main company. He's, uh, if you're familiar with Always Sunny in Philadelphia, he's like the weird uncle's kind of um, uh, sexual predator, predator oh, like with the a one must- that, mustache like, and everything. Like he, he's, he represents him as a lawyer Lo- sometimes. Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's Andrew Friedman. <laughs> and uh, he was in the class and all that stuff. And uh, it was good. But then I went to the uh, uh, dark period. There was a long waiting period. And so I sat idle for a while. Uh. And then everyone else, and everyone kept telling me, and here, here you come. Here it comes again, Beardo. Yeah, yeah. Everyone go tell me. Go to other places. Train, 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 train. Yeah. I was like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm waiting for the groundlings, and uh, I was busy with work, and I'm gonna write some scripts, and uh, I don't want to go prepare. <laughs> <laughs> so at this time, where are you working? The security job? I, I, yeah, I was, I was a, a supervisor of the security job. Been mm-hmm. there a couple of years now, and um, it's like 2002. So you're making good money? No, no, no. I never make good money. You're no, just no. like getting by. Just getting by. Oh, so you were getting by, and, and then... I'm bad at saving money, as you know now. So <laughs> yeah. uh, it was struggle. Yeah, yeah. A lot of Tina's burritos, twenty five cents, um, <laughs> a burrito at the time. Yeah. So, so then I got in the. Then I did an improv class, five week intensive improv class. That's where I met Creston Wig for the first time, and wow. some other great people who went on to be uh, very successful in the business. And then uh, Kent Sumplet, who's actually one of the head writers of SNL right now, wow. and uh, Mikey Mike Rose, all this stuff. Um, anyways, I've gotten to the final level of Vance, and that's where. It steps up. Uh, Mikey this, Mikey Day was in the class. Kristen Wiggs in the class. Nicole wow. Randall Johnson on Mad TV. My friend Andrew Hachi. Tim Tim Blaine Tim Blaney, who was uh, the voice of Johnny Five and Frank the Pug and Men in Black. Wow. Uh, Peter Sprite, uh, Melinda Hill. All these people who you could go Google the names and find stuff they've done, or just go to a movie theater. Yeah. yeah. And um, and I I absolutely held my own. Make mm-hmm. no mistake, I held my own. But I started to learn I wasn't the actor that these people were, mm. which is fine. Um, but I was a writer. I was one of the best writers, but I wasn't, I couldn't break out of some stuff and some severe depression had started to set in my life. And that was sliding into my characters and my writing where I wasn't writing funny stuff. I was working through my emotions. It was actually like a showing up in the material. It was my teacher, my director, Karen Mariama, Karen Mariama was one of the first to pull me aside and, yeah. and was like, just in terms of the class I was like, Hey, I want you to try some different sketches. And I was like, cool. And she's like, I want you to write a sketch about a character that feels good about himself, that gets the girl, is successful, and is not angry. Wow. I was like, cool, cool. She's like, because that's all you write. 
I was like, oh, oh, okay. At the time, it was fine. It's at the time you were what mid twenties? Uh, twenty five. So, range, yeah. So what? What was? What was the issue? Were you going through a bad breakup or something? No, I never. I didn't have a girlfriend until I was twenty eight. Um, mm-hmm. first real girlfriend. Um, no, no, no. What was? What was the depression that was sitting setting in? Uh, I think the, the the social anxiety, the social awkwardness, not knowing how to handle mm-hmm. life. So you you felt like an outsider still, and you just feel like yes. why why can't I be like a normal person? And I was yes, and I was not connecting to the people there. Oh. Um, so and I didn't at the time I didn't drink, which is great. If you don't want to drink, don't drink. I, I mm-hmm. didn't start till later, and I, I don't recommend it if you don't want to do it. Um, but there'd be times some of my friends from the Groundlings would, after class would be like, "Hey, you want to go get a beer?" Yeah, I'd be like, "Oh, I don't drink," and I drive home <laughs> alone to my uh, place then in, in Canoga Park, far away, and I'd hide and and I'll wait for Lauren Michaels to call me. Yeah. Well, you know, that's how not how you make connections and not how you make friends and that's how not how you grow as a performer and a writer and as a person and social, you know, we need social lives. Yeah, yeah. And um I was just this 25-year-old hermit who was afraid of life. And so that that affected me more than anything. I make jokes, you'll hear jokes about being voted out of the groundlings. Thousands of people are voted out of the groundlings. That yeah. wasn't my problem. I could have inherited the earth. I think I just got so hung up in my own failures and just self-defeating. So you were like kind of like ruining it for yourself you yeah were just saying no to everything yeah no i uh, no one improv you say yes and oh, yeah. no um i just here's a case in point like i had no confidence in myself at this point mm-hmm. so the first 99 2000 i'm kicking ass in these classes yeah and like i'm telling you when i'd get up to do improv a scene there'd be a hush ken's getting up ken's oh. getting up yeah but by this four, fourth year mm-hmm. um people love me I was friends i'm still friends with a lot of those people to this day but um they i would break out in sweats on stage i would i would struggle i, I totally lost a lot of confidence mm. um so there's a i think i've told the story somewhere else maybe on a podcast but there's a if you google Kristen wig melinda hill tooth fairy uh-huh. it's a sketch on youtube and it was filmed in 2002 at this our final show mm-hmm. or one of our final shows we did two shows and it's a great sketch about two tooth fairies talking about um you know what they bad things they do to children it's great and Kristen's obviously great and Melinda Hill was great too uh I'm right around the corner off stage like if you look at the stage I'm literally behind you can almost see my shadow I'm waiting for my scene to go next Mm -hmm. and I'm listening to this and I literally in my head was like I'm done I'm not I'm gonna be voted out Uh my career everything I wanted is done I'm I'm done and like in the middle of the show depression overtook me like right then right then whoa was it because like because this person is so good you can't live up to that? They were so good and I it wasn't that I was comparing myself to them. It was because I was so supportive. Yeah. Um I just realized I wasn't doing what they were doing. Which was just which was the, uh, at another level. Yeah. And I was so wrapped up in myself def- my self-defeating ways that I wasn't going to break free. Well, you think you th- you didn't think like hey, maybe if I work hard I can get to that point. Or if I learned from them or, or developed something. I would have now. Yeah. You know, now I would have. Mm-hmm. I'm confident, more confident now. I still self, self-doubt every day, but, you know. But yeah. it's like what they say, like with a stand-up, don't see someone that's great because, like when you first start out, don't see someone that's great because mm-hmm. you won't, you'll get defeated and say, hey, right. I, I will never be able to do that. See kind of like someone in right. the uh, open just, mic. Or... It's just mindset. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's mindset. Uh-huh. You know, my mindset. I, I still do it now. Mm-hmm. My girlfriend's been slapping me upside the head because I'll say, like, oh, I just moved. You know, I'm living by myself for the first time. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can afford this. She'll be like, stop saying that. <laughs> if you stop saying that, you'll be able to afford it. Yeah, yeah. And it's not this hippy-dippy stuff. It's just, she's like, there's it's like, you just this is your mindset. And I think that was so much stronger back then, nearly 20 years ago, mm-hmm. um, that that it, it took me out of competition. What do you think that is, though? Like, when you, say, when you bring up these things, when you say, I won't be able to do this, I won't be able to do that. Do you think it's like wanting like kind of like pity for you or because that's what I think when I say I won't be able to do this. It's mm-hmm. like, do I want somebody to feel sorry for me? That's in there. I think, look, I'm, you know, as someone who suffered depression off and on over the last, you know, his whole life, mm-hmm. um, I don't I don't take it lightly. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, depression is a self-centered condition. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so my mom would say. I wouldn't take the advice, but my mom in my darkest days would be like, go volunteer at an animal shelter. Go feed the homeless. Mm. Go talk to a friend about their problems because you're so focused on your problems. Mm. And again, I'm saying that carefully. So if anyone's out there struggling with depression, it's not a finger wagging at you. It's just kind of what I feel the base level it is. So depression and in that mindset, yeah, to make, it's like you're so locked into it. Mm. You just, it's self-pity. And sometimes it literally is 
just don't do that. Yeah. It's like sabotaging yourself, yeah. but then it's like a vicious circle. Where like you sabotage, then you get worse. And you, you get worse and worse and worse. And it's mm. chemical. Don't mm. the, you know? I, I get a lot of it from my father, mm. um, without a doubt. Oh, you um, think like he was like depre- he's a quiet, depressed person. Uh. Yeah. So I, without a doubt, believe it's 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 not necessarily like an easy light switch you can turn on and off. Yeah. Or but t- at the same t- time, it is. At the same time, we control our thoughts. At yeah. the same time, there's ways to do it and the ways to seek help. And sometimes, you know, sometimes some of us have more access to that help or some of us think we have more access to our, that help than others. But um, you can work on it. And a lot of it is talking to other people. Mm-hmm. But I, I worry, like, uh, my depression, I, I turned it into humor. Yeah. Other people, other people can turn it into attention. And I think that's a dangerous road. What do you mean attention? Like using it to call attention to themselves in, uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a bad way. And it's not necessarily helping other people. Like saying I'm going to hurt myself no, to, to dad, get attention? No, dad, or just constantly talking about it. Oh, okay. And I used to say I make depression funny. Yeah, yeah. And that's what comics do. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, even that's a mindset because you see where it leads comics. So do you feel a lot of comics are depressed? I think a lot of, yeah, absolutely. Because they are hiding behind that humor? They're and hiding they're... behind it. That's how we deal with it. Yeah, um, yeah. One of my friends who's a great comic is not depressed, has battled it. He's more angry. Uh-huh. So he hides his anger through his comedy. He's yeah. an angry person. Yeah, yeah. An angry Italian. <laughs> and it works. I was depressive and it and it worked sometimes. Sometimes it didn't work because I was too self-loathing. And, mm. and the audience doesn't want to, at some point the audience is like, shut up. Yeah, yeah. Shut up and entertain us. That's the thing. Like, like you don't, like we shouldn't feel sorry for you. We should be laughing at you. Yeah, or and with it, you. Or yeah, 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 with you. So, and there's some, I, and I had a lot, I've seen it work. I've seen, there's this idea. A lot of people get into stand up and we're like, I'm depressed. I'm going to work through it. Mm-hmm. Ah, you got to be entertaining. Yeah. yeah. Anything could be funny. Mark Maron can tell a great story about suicide yeah. and make it funny. Uh-huh. He was once attacked on stage for it. Uh, if you ever hear that story, but it, you can still make it funny. Mm-hmm. And there was times where I wasn't making it funny, which is why my stand up career never went where I thought it could have gone. So you to you got into stand up like to work out that depression right after the groundling. So in two thousand two, December two thousand two, uh, December seventeenth two thousand two at two thirty three in the morning, <laughs> is when I was told I was voted out of the groundlings. At um, two in the morning, two thirty in the morning. Yeah, the vote is after the second. They uh, you perform and then everyone the groundlings get together and vote on you. Oh wow. Um, and then the next day though, I saw two towers in the theater and all was well. Um, <laughs> but I I got told, hey, you're done. And again. Thousands upon thousands of people get told that in this town. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's not the end, be all, end all of a path. But for, at the time, it was, I told, in 99, I was so confident. I'm going to do this. I'm going to be in SNL. I'm going to do movies. This is it. My career is starting. Yeah. Yay. And it wasn't like an arrogant, like, I'm going to be famous. It's just like, cool, this is this seems like how it should go. Yeah, yeah. So when you're told, nope, doesn't work, like, you're, you're kicked out of your dreams. And I didn't <laughs> deal with it well. Mm. And that's when next level depression came in and, uh, you know, suicidal thoughts and all that kind of thing. Um, and then after that, I, but, but six months later, uh, I was, my friends were like, you've got to, you've got to go to stand up. What did you do for six months? You just I played busy a lot working? of Madden. Yeah. Uh, a lot of Madden. Played yeah. it until uh, my eyes, eyes fell off. And then one day, you ever do that thing where that you play a video game and it says, do not turn off the power while this icon's saving? <laughs> yeah. I accidentally turned off my Madden and I was like 22 seasons in on franchise mode. <laughs> it corrupted it. It corrupted everything. And I sat on there <laughs> on the edge of this little Ikea table and cried. Wow. And I was like, what is my life? <laughs> what is my life? What's become of this? So that was, that was your life. That was a security job in Madden. Yeah. 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 And just, you know, in a job I didn't like uh-huh. and a car- with my career dead and starting to see some other people succeed. And again, I wasn't f- negatively focused on that, but it was kind of this like, you know, not focused on the mm. positive side of what I could do, not seeing the opportunities before me. And you were still young at the time, like mid 25, 26. Yeah, yeah. Like yeah, you still, dude, come on. Yeah, yeah. So much more time to yeah, go. Yeah. Leslie Jones gets on SNL at 40 years old. Absolutely. Yeah, Late yeah. 40s, I believe. You yeah. know what I mean? Um, Fred Armisen has a whole career as a drummer and decides to get into comedy and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. So Phil Hartman was a graphic designer first. Uh, as yeah. was Kristen Wiig. She studied graphic design wow. and all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, so, Phil Hartman showed up late, too. He late. Was, yeah, 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 very late. In the late, late 70s, he actually designed a lot of albums for bands and everything. Wow. Um, so, so as, But as a 25-year-old, you think, I'm, I'm the done. The world's done. You ever watch mm. the movie High Fidelity with John Cusack no, or read the book? But no. uh, uh, I highly suggest 
both of those. Reading the book by Nick Hornby, uh-huh. uh, those, that's my favorite. And there's a point of, you know, he's, he's talking about he and his ex-girlfriend getting together because they're alone at 26, and, and they're the type of person that believes they're going to be alone forever at 26. I was that kind of person at 26. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be alone forever. I'm not going to have a career. This is how I better end it because I better just end my life because I've got nothing left. Wow. But but it it seems so crazy now thinking back at twenty six you're like you're you're fucking twenty six year old like you have years ahead of you absolutely yeah absolutely and it's so easy now hindsight's very clear in twenty twenty but mm-hmm. I get it so I don't disparage or discount anyone who goes online and says they're depressed or tells me they're depressed or comes up to me people come up to me hey one of your podcasts has uh, got me through my depression I take it very seriously yeah but there's also a part of me that believes slap yourself upside the head and just go succeed like you just just do it yeah is what is what you're saying yeah. or ha- yes just do it yeah, yeah. have those thoughts because again a lot of it's chemical uh-huh. a lot of it's going to be hard go to therapy if you can't afford therapy find some t- find a friend you ha- whatever i get it i get it's hard mm-hmm. but find find that but at the same time shut the f up yeah. and go do it yeah or shut the F up and don't do that thing that makes you unhappy. Yeah. Shut the F up and go lose that weight you need. Go do whatever you think things holding you back. Still have the, you're going to have these negative thoughts. Beardo, I still wake up some days, look in the mirror and think this, I need to die. You know what I mean? Why? Because it's depression. It's going to be there. It's but, never going to go away. So, oh, so you think it's going to, it's going to stay with it's you It's going to stay with it. That's so that's why I mean how serious I take it. Uh-huh. At the same time, I absolutely believe at the end of the day, the the power is going to lie in me to make that choice. So you never like think about acting upon it. You just you just I've I've had, but that was again in my twenties. Oh, that was, okay, but yeah. like now you now, say it no. just appears. I'm, and I'm you past just, that test. Yeah. You laugh it off now. I got pretty depressed uh, last couple years. Mm-hmm. The tail end of my last career, I was really done with it. Really tired. Felt my life had at 39, mm-hmm. 38, 39 was like, I'm stuck in this career I didn't want. And I made, I should have, I should have become a police officer uh-huh. when my uncle told me to at 25, 22 to 25. He was like, go do that. Even up to 30, it was like, you know, yeah. up to 35. I think LAPD's <laughs> limits are 40 now. Uh-huh. Um, I should have done that. I would have been a good cop. I should have done that. I should have done this. A lot of that. But what have you, would you have been happy at that? Like doing, that. I don't know. Yeah. That's the thing that I always tell people. Yeah. I tell my uncle and be like, uh, you know, I mean, now I wouldn't be happy. I, I want to be a police officer. Part of me does. Mm-hmm. Another part of me want to be a firefighter. Sure. Great. But I don't know if I'd still at the end of the day, I'd want to perform. Uh-huh. And he'd be like, cool, you can do that. Police work three, three days of 12 hour shifts a lot in LAPD. Like you'll have uh-huh. four days to do whatever else you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I couldn't see the forest for the trees because I'm so wrapped up in depression and so uh-huh. focused and stubborn on, on things that, um, I got lost in it. Yeah. 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 So but, what did, what did you do to help like that? Like, when you were 25, 26, your, your career, you think your career is over. What did you do? Uh, I just, I was doing stand up and started, that's when I met Christian and Mark Ellis and those guys. And, and, uh, did you meet them at like the improv or the store? I met Christian at Hollywood improv. He was doing shows with us for rebels of comedy, which later became white boy comedy run by a guy named Mark Franco. And I had, I had actually met, met Mark Ellis before at the belly room at the comedy store in like 2003. Mm-hmm. Mark was a horrible comic and I was a horrible comic. <laughs> and then Mark just became one of the best and I'm, yeah. I was okay. But um, so, I didn't see Mark again for like three years. So you guys kind of started off together or like? Mark and I started off around the same time. Christian had already been doing it and I think he was uh, already a regular at the comedy store. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, it's so funny. You guys don't even now fully understand, appreciate that Harloff was christian harloff stand-up comic like he was he was he walked in a room you're like that's one of the best yeah and you know obviously still got the entertaining side to him that's mm-hmm. still but it was like he was one of the top docs yeah. and so um i had trouble i was joke but i had trouble breaking through to him before become friends because it was i had such reverence for what he did on stage and for him as a performer and everything so i wouldn't really talk to him that much oh you were scared of him uh, or, kind of or intimidated. like intimidated intimidated not in a negative way yeah, but yeah. it was just like i don't want to bother him yeah um what would he show up like like he was the big dog and yeah, yeah. girls loved him yeah, you, know, yeah. you know how many times and he's happily married now we know this a yeah. father of a soon to be two yeah uh, that, that 2006 harloff thing you think i can't tell you how many times i'd have <laughs> female friends i'd be like in my head i'd be like i kind of think this girl's cute she'd be like hey what do you know about christian yeah <laughs> All the time. And it just ruined, makes the depression even more. Like, makes what? the depression ever more because I was lonely. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I wasn't dating, you know. I mean, all this kind of stuff going on in my head. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So stand-up, I'm glad I did it, it, it and I might one day do it again, but not, not never full-time, never be a pursuit. Was the, What was the first time you went up on stage for stand-up? 
Uh, March 2003, Belly Room. Uh, oh, it's the Belly Room. The comedy store, yeah, yeah. Did they have open mics in the Belly Room? No, or? it was a book show. Uh, my oh. friend Peter Sprite and a guy named Brian Irwin were running a room. Peter was in the Groundlings. He was the one who actually told me, along with a guy named, another classmate named Brian Keith Etheridge, who's mm -hmm. a showrunner and writer for a lot of stuff. Uh, they're like, we'll get you into stand up. And yeah. so they, we booked the show. We was like, voted out of the Groundlings, and all of us in the class that had been <laughs> voted out, Hayes Hargrove, all these people. Um, did this show and uh Kara Sultanovich headlined and uh I killed I was like a packed room of 50 people and it was like killed my friend Peter was like this is the best stand-up debut I've ever seen you like, actually killed your first time killed the first time gonna be great yeah. and he's like but don't worry about it none of it matters the next time you get on stage what you did the night before doesn't matter yeah it starts over yeah and it's... and that was hard Wait. that was hard you when you, when you start to fail yeah that's that, that's what people don't fully get about comedy well, you, you could kill i'd kill 220 people at improv just slay them with stuff next night 10 people at a mexican restaurant in brentwood california <laughs> and 10 people staring at you like they want to you yeah. know throw you off the stage they're looking at the tv behind you with the, oh, with the, the sports worst. game on that's how i quit stand that was my fine that was my final straw what? i drove two hours me and my friend at the time a uh, roommate at the time a friend of mine named sam ventura uh -huh. drove two hours in traffic to huntington beach to a room <laughs> run by a guy named johnny laquasto that everyone knows now uh -huh. um been on the schmodown dc movie news Johnny was running shows. He lived down there in Huntington Beach. We drove two hours, a sports bar, playing. People were playing billiards on front of the stage. Wouldn't leave. <laughs> Dodger game on. Eight people there, and I got eight, eight, maybe ten dollars cash. Yeah. And I was like, "What am I doing?" <laughs> oh, so so that was was that the only time you were thinking, "What am I doing?" Or was no, that the no, last that time? was like, "What am I doing?" Why I quit stand up, and even though I came back a couple times and everything, why I quit it was I played out what I'd want it to be. Mm -hmm. What if I'm successful? Yeah. What if this works out? And that is on the road half of the year, sometimes more, mm -hmm. um, just doing this night after night. And I didn't want to do that. And so you played out, you mean you played out your future? Like, okay, yeah. what, what's, what's next? If I, if I yeah. become a road comic, yeah. like what's it, whatever that I got 30 minute special. Right. Like what, yeah. like I just didn't, that wasn't the career I wanted. Now mm -hmm. I didn't know at the time what I wanted. Yeah. And this whole thing we're, we're recording now in the Collider Studios this didn't exist. YouTube was just popping up. Yeah. Christian and Mark were starting to re review movies. And I can tell you, all of us were like, you're idiots. What are you doing? <laughs> oh, but for the, for them uh, yeah. wanting to start a YouTube channel or yeah, podcast they or did. something? they did. It's yeah. Schmoes. No, what the hell Schmoes? No. <laughs> Why are you guys talking about movies? Yeah. What are you doing? No one's going to watch. No YouTube's gonna... where you watch cat videos and Andy Samberg rap videos. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. And I give Christian and Mark all the credit. They're like, this is what we're doing. And, and it's totally, that's why we have, that's why I am where I am now. I'll never forget that. Never give them, not give them credit for that. So, so did you always have that relationship with Christian? Like, did it? Yeah, we, we were always close. So, I mean, so we did... became close once, once we, once we were close, we're always in the circle. Yeah. How did you break through if you were like intimidated by him? And... We started talking about, I was a host. I was hosting a lot of the shows. So I'd have to do uh, intros. And uh, so you have to come up and talk to people at that mm. point. And, uh, he'd be in his head. And what I took, I took for it then is aloofness and mm. maybe arrogance, um, was actually him just getting ready to perform. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I be me being a depressive, self centered person was like, it must be about me. Yeah. yeah. No, he was just getting his head to perform. He, he'd wear this little long shoreman beanie to tease him about and this <laughs> yeah. like sweater and have headphones in and everything. And then we started talking about well, something came up about either G.I. Joe or Transformers or some kind of property. It wasn't Star Wars yet. And it was like, oh, you, oh, you know, Megatron too, like it was some yeah. reference. And then, you know, legitimately he was one of the top comics in our circle. So I would introduce him all the time as, you know, here's one of my favorite comics. And so, you know, buttered him up a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And then we, we slowly became friends by 2000, late 2006, 2007, we were, we were, we were tight. So did you guys like hit it off through the comedy or through the movies or did you, did he Not, see? Through the pop culture. And, oh, okay. And we talked about professional wrestling, mm. but it wasn't a, you know, also like, cool, you wrote for the WWE, that's great. But yeah, it was just, it was just friends. You'd see, we performed at the same place, Room 5, which is no longer there, on La Brea above the Acme Comedy Theater, above an Italian restaurant called Amalfi, which is no longer there. That is co owned that was co owned by Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla. And we uh -huh. were we would be upstairs every Thursday, our group of guys mm -hmm. and and gals too. Let's not forget that. Um Jody Miller, Eliza Schlesinger, all those guys they were wow. there all, every week. Uh huh. And we just all were kind of a kind of a crew. And be, you know, you obviously become closer with a couple of them. Me, me and a friend uh, named Chip Dornell. Yeah. He's actually doing some writing for the Schmodown now, I think. He wrote for Jeopardy for a long time. Uh, he was a he helped run the shows and he and I are close and um Chris and I and then Ellis eventually came to those rooms. He wasn't that's why I didn't see Ellis for about three or four years. Mm. He started to show up to do do stuff there and it just all kind of clicked. 
So that was your life at that time. Was that like a good po- good point in your life? It was an okay point. I didn't know what I was doing. No, you, you didn't, but you you were doing stand up. Were were you good at it? Christian says you were good at it, but you weren't. All right. You weren't comfortable with. it. I wasn't comfortable. I, I was. I struggled to find my voice, which, by the way, is normal. Yeah. My friend Peter Sprite gave me this list of advice to start for stand up, and he's like, "Your first one hundred shows do not count." Yeah, your first like five years don't count. Don't count. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Gary Shandling worked the door at the comedy store for seven years before he even got like major stage time. Yeah, yeah. So you can lose sight about that and not feel that immediate success. Mm-hmm. And the nice thing about stand up, here's the thing I could go back in 20 years and start doing stand up mm. and be like funny old guy on stage, but I could do it. Yeah, yeah. And they're not, there might not be a ceiling over me for success. Mm-hmm. I might not be able to get a special and all that kind of stuff. But you know, like Dangerfield went back in his 50s, reworked his career career and became who we know him now yeah so that's what's great about stand-up but yeah uh yeah was i good i had some moments what was, what was your material like how did a lot of self-loathing imagine that <laughs> oh yeah uh, um, a lot of self-loathing um so that was when you first went up and you said you killed on your first time it was all self-loathing self-loathing jokes, jokes and yeah. everything and that's a fine line it's yeah. a fine line if you're a young comic out there a young writer it's a fine line yeah um again you have to be able to find it funny and make it funny so there was times i would talk about suicidal incidents that i had mm-hmm. and it wasn't funny yeah i thought it was i have a, <laughs> I have head, a, yeah. I have a weird subtle sense i was a comics comic i've said this before in other podcasts i was a comics comic and that means the comics to this day mark ellis and christian included would be like oh you were funny yeah the audiences were like we don't get it uh what who, is that reference? Who were your guys growing up? Like, who were who you into as a comic? Um, Bill Cosby, I mm-hmm. will say. Yeah. Uh, it's That's weird to say now, but mm-hmm. Bill Cosby himself is the reason I wanted, first wanted to make people laugh. So, so you, were, were you into like more storytelling? Because storytelling, he, yeah, Bill, yeah. So, yeah, that 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 Bill Cosby himself special yeah. is all those stories. And in eighth grade, when I was part of the speech and debate team for my junior high, as well as the drama class, I won two speech tournaments. Um, basically doing cover songs of Bill Cosby stuff. There was a category called humorous interpretation where you'd, you'd take already published material and make it your own and everything. Oh, so did so you- I wasn't plagiarizing. It was like, that was the, the category. So oh, so I, you weren't like reenacting in a himself a bit or were you like- I, No, so I, I would take some of his bits uh-huh. and, and perform them. Oh, okay. And I won tournaments. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so he was early. Um, Steve Martin's always been one to yeah. this day, but I became a Steve Martin fan as an actor and a Saturday Night Live host and yeah. a writer. And then I, I was too young. He re- left stand up in what, 1980? Yeah, he was one of the biggest stand ups. He yeah. just like left it all. So I've him. gone back and appreciated his stand up, but I definitely became a Steve Martin fan from his films first. But he's one of mine. Mm-hmm. Um, Dennis Miller, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, but Oddly enough, Joel Hodson, before he was on MST, MST3K, oh, okay. uh, he was my kind of joke teller too. Very subtle, very wry. So, so that was your style, or you just my like style. Yeah. just like not kinda... a Kinnison. <laughs> not I like Dennis Leary. I love actually. I love Rescue Me. He's one of my all time favorite shows. So I like Leary, but I wasn't that style. I wasn't Bill Hicks. I don't. I don't. I get Bill Hicks. I don't like Bill Hicks. As a you know, uh-huh. rest in peace. Um, George Carlin wasn't necessarily my type. I, but again, Richard. I loved Richard Lewis. Um, but I got to tell you, my dad, I give him credit again, used to let me watch Saturday Night Live, which is weird for conservative Christian home. Yeah. It, like mom would go to bed and he'd let me watch SNL. But before SNL came on at 1130 on, on 11 o'clock was a show called Comic Strip Live. Um, uh, Gary Kroger hosted it for one portion of it, maybe Wayne Cotter, I think for the other time. And it was taped down here and it was all stand up. So I would watch Tim Allen, Tom Arnold, all these people. And they do these stand up specials. Uh, seven minute chunks it was just like eight comics on a show and yeah, it was yeah. broadcast on fox channel 11 before i grew up and um that got me cu- cued into like stand-up as a thing but i couldn't wrap my head around it sketch comedy was easy to wrap my head around like what do you mean you can wrap like how does someone become I, a stand-up or like, do no stand-up? no like I literally like i didn't know how to write a bit or a joke and that's common a lot of people don't yeah but I, it's easier to comprehend uh, writing a sketch mm. or creating a character yeah and then just going up and being yourself which really you're not being yourself you're finding a character that's you yeah um and which is you know me the newscaster on schmoes is a character you're it's being not, a version of yourself yeah being yeah. a version yeah, um, yeah it's not that i'm lying it's uh-huh. just that this is me on camera this is what you're gonna get it's different um so I struggled. That's the key to from being a good stand-up. You couldn't find your voice. You couldn't, couldn't find, find your, my your voice. Boy, or, um, you couldn't find the version ex- of yourself. Too exposed. 
What do you mean? What do you mean to expose? I, so when I'd go up on stage and I, I would tell my bits and jokes, and and if it didn't work, I felt like it just felt I felt naked on stage. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like so, it was tough. It was very tough. Um, that's why, like, I joke. You know, the first time I saw Mark Ellis, I remember him, Fat Ellis. Yeah. Um, and he he wasn't funny. You know, yeah. in terms of a stand up. Because no, nobody is when yeah. they're, when they're so first starting. F- four years later, when he starts showing up again, I was like, oh, I remember this dude. This, guy, this, this dude's cool. Yeah. He wasn't really funny. <laughs> and then I saw him perform, and I was like, oh, this guy got funny. Now, Mark was always funny. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But as a stand-up, he had to find that voice, and he uh, found it. Yeah. Like, when, you, when you're talking about, like, playing out your future and laying out your life yeah. with, with stand-up, like, I see Ellis going out every weekend. And yeah. That's something you wouldn't like to do. I'm okay with it. Ellis and I talk about, like, we love hotel life. Like, uh, I love, like, when I was a Screen Junkies, we did tours of conventions for a while. Like, every six weeks or so, we were going out to conventions with Wizard World, and I love that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I, that's every six weeks. Uh, Mark, Mark's one of those guys that's some, you know, three, four weekends in a row. He's, he's in got, Texas. He's, he's in, out. Yeah, yeah. And he loves that. I, 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 I would grow a little tired of that. Of of just being like on the road, yeah. You so traveling is yeah, thing, yeah. But you then why do you like hotel life then? Hotel life just meaning like I I don't like camping. Uh huh. I love nature, but I don't like to take me back to a cabin. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there's something about it. Ellis and I. I wish he was here to talk about it. We love hotel life. Give me a nice <laughs> hotel. Like give me a hotel bar. Oh yeah. Give me a good check in. Give me a nice room with a turned down bed. Like I love it. Yeah, yeah. I love it. But only only once in a while though. Only once in a while. But you so you, do you like it because like you can be alone and just be alone. With... It's, a, it's a it's a foreign environment. Like I didn't travel much as a kid. We were we weren't we weren't very rich, so I didn't mm. travel much. I didn't fly on a plane till like my late twenties. Like my family, we just didn't have the money. We didn't have the reason. We take tri- trips locally. Yeah, yeah. So we just didn't travel. So I haven't been abroad yet. Um, but I've been all around the United States now, thanks to uh, some trips, some cross country drives, screen junkies, now Collider. Mm-hmm. You know, like I said I for my whole life from like twelve, thirteen on. Oh, you got to go to New York. Yeah, yeah. And I was a Beatles fan. I was a Saturday Night Live fan. I was a New York Yankee fan. Yeah. Um, had never been to New York. <laughs> yeah. And then in 2015, I finally go to New York with Screen Junkies, and I was like, oh. Oh, I get it. Why did it take you so long, though? Why didn't you go when you were like 28, 29, 30? It's, I just didn't have anyone to go with, didn't have any reason. I had one friend who lived out there for a long time, and I, I regret it because he, he took a job back here in Sacramento, but he was out there. Make, he was a, a construction foreman type of higher up guy, making good money, even, yeah. even for New York. He's like, dude, I'll fly, take a week off. I'll fly you out to Manhattan. Huh. Stay with me for a week. Well, hang on. I was like, oh, I don't, I don't. Uh, I get very finicky. Yeah, yeah. I get very finicky and kind of stubborn to set my ways. And like for a long time, travel through my twenties. Yeah, yeah, travel was like I don't want to leave my comfort zone again because I have more than people realize severe social anxiety. Yeah, that's that's the same thing with me too. It's mm-hmm. like, do you when someone asks you, do you want to go somewhere? I said, no, I don't want to go there. Yeah, yeah. Now I got good after a while. Uh, what? What? How do you fix it? What, mid mid thirties. Yeah, uh, and this is why I say, you know we're always growing up and the person, the depressed person I was at 25 was not the person I was at 30. Mm-hmm. And the person I was at 30 was not the person I was at 35. Now 35 to now 41 has been relatively the same and, and, and in a good way. Yeah. Um, because I, I really started to find myself at 35 and that's when I was like, screw it. We're going out. I'm going out drinking with some friends. Yeah. Uh, we're going to go travel. I'm going to go take a trip here. Uh, I got forced to travel more with screen junkies and it, and it put me in a great spot where, uh-huh. You know, I loved you know wandering New York City at night by myself and heading back to the room and 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 feeling like I was connected to something bigger than my small town. You know, I was, grew up in the small town. Yeah, yeah. And it's the small town blues, and you don't really there's a whole world out there. It's Luke Skywalker on Tatooine. That's why we connect to that. And I finally got on the Falcon and flew. Man. Yeah, yeah. So you, you're you're in this different world. Then why did and you think back like why didn't I do this sooner? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's what, and that, yeah, absolutely. Why didn't I take risks? And, and, cause I think if you're someone like me, it's not necessarily ties to depression, but, um, you're afraid it's not, it's not fear of failure. Uh huh. It's just fear of getting hurt. I was, my, my mother was very protective and I'm not blaming her for anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I went five years of therapy to work through this stuff. Um, very protective. Yeah. So even now, it's like my mom's worried about me getting hurt, sometimes even physically. Yeah. Yeah. And I grew up in that type of environment, and so I didn't take those kind of chances. Like, I wasn't I wasn't kicked out of the plane. Mm. You know what I mean? Jump, 
A lot of, oh. a lot of people do that. And I think I think there's a balance. Yeah, yeah. You don't want to toss your kid in the deep end and have him drown. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there was a balance. I was I think I I was I just grew up in my 20s. So I moved to LA. I said earlier I didn't know how to do it. I didn't know how to I I could function, had a job, paid my bills. Mm -hmm. I'm a fully functional adult. But how do you go make friends? How do you uh, go get auditions? How do you go take acting class? I just, I, I turtle, turtle shelled and you were spent a, a decade like holding on to myself. Like, don't move. We'll be okay. Wow. You're in a bubble, like bubble by like not kind of caused by your mother. Yeah. Well, I mean, it just my upbringing and not yeah, breaking yeah. out of it. Because I know. feel my mom's the same way. She's always like, let me know when you get there. Let me yeah. know when you get home. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Then, my yeah. mom's fine now. But if I go home and visit yeah. and I drive home to LA, I have to text her, mom, I'm home safe. Yeah. The same thing. And that's, I think that instills a fear in me too. Is she's like, cause she's like thinking, is something going to happen to me? And then I yeah. start thinking, is something going to happen to me? Yeah. If I go out here, is, is, am I, am I going to get hurt? Am I not going to make it home? Yeah. 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 And I'm in this, I'm in the same way. We're the same bubble where it's like, I don't right. really want to go outside. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you and me, Beardo, we'll stay inside talking podcasts. All yeah. Day. And it's fine. And that's it. And so that, that creeps into areas. So it might, you might think, well, it means, I should have tried out for the baseball team, but it yeah. also means I have trouble going to a new dry cleaner because I'm afraid. Yeah. And the, and then, but you think like, what's the worst that can happen? That's the attitude that started to set in the thirties. Yeah. In, in my thirties, I had two relationships that ended and I was okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, I wasn't in a puddle of tears. Yeah. Uh, my twenties, I was so sad and lonely. I wrote poems and I was sad and uh, no, dressed in black. No yeah. one loves me. Well, of course, no one loves you because you keep telling everyone you're not lovable. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's what I mean. Going back earlier to the depression, I respect it. I have it. I struggle with depression, mm -hmm. but you're creating your own bed to lie in sometimes, and that's what I was with the doing. depression. You're not. You're not really offering anybody anything. You're not offering. Guess what? Yeah, it is kind of miserable to be around depressed people. <laughs> yeah. Guess what? That's mm -hmm. the reality of it. Yeah, yeah. So in my 30s, 35, I came out of this, I uh, uh, was in a relationship, but came out of it um, in mid 30s. But I, um, I was like, uh, screw it. We're going to have fun. Not like crazy drink, you know, get hookers type of fun. But like, I'm going to stay at the three in the morning at a comedy store porch with Mark Ellis. Yeah. And we're going to have fun. I'm going to go travel. I'm going to go take a chance. Uh, be discovering um, podcasting when mm -hmm. I had so looked down on it for so long. Mm -hmm. podcasting sprung up and i remember hearing about it and i was like what is this thing <sighs> i was in radio <laughs> i was in radio you're too good for it too good for it i'm, yeah, I'm yeah. saying that i admit it fully i was yeah, yeah. literally like i'm too good for this uh -huh. i was a disc jockey how dare you i spun tunes on the radio yeah, yeah. 95.3 kwbr um you're a broadcaster as a broadcaster yeah and I'm still uppity about it. There's a lot of people in the YouTube space, a lot of people in this podcasting world who are not broadcasters. Just because you own microphones does not mean you should do it. And I'll say that. <laughs> yeah. It's like Mark Maron saying about the stand-up comedy boom in the late 80s created a lot of shitty comics. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of shitty podcasters and little shitty broadcasters and a lot of shitty YouTube reviewers. And uh -huh. I'll get on my high horse on that still, Beardo. Yeah. But. Um, I also agree with people taking a chance and learning and, and getting to find your voice because I was a shitty stand-up. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I finally was like, I'm going to try this podcasting thing because Harloff and Ellis were yeah. doing it. 2011, they, I think around 11, they launched the original version of the Schmoes No Podcast. Uh -huh. I, was, I came in to talk Star Wars with them on like the second and third episode and was like, oh, that was fun. Yeah, yeah. We had headphones. We had <laughs> microphones. This is like radio. Yeah, yeah. But I still then was like, all right, all right. I was trying around, but then when they went to Toad Hop mm. and it was, you had cameras and I, and it was a radio station because Frank of uh, Frank and Heidi was behind it. Yeah. And it was, he's a, a broadcaster. And I was like, oh, and it's live. Oh, this is what I've been wanting to do my whole life because I started to, and I left it. Mm. I should have stuck with it. So you felt it was more legitimized by that studio? It was legi legitimized a little bit, but also I got what was what you could do with it. Oh, okay. And that, again, I, I'm saying this with egg on my face. I was, <laughs> I was stupid, Beardo. I was stupid. <laughs> I could have started podcasting in 2004 or five. Yeah, yeah. The first time I started hearing about it, Colt Cabana uh, has a wrestling podcast. Mark Maron was starting his stuff. Like yeah, I, yeah. I was a big fan of Phil Hendry, the radio guy, and he started to cross over into some of that stuff. Um, I, I should have... Should have got in there. Talk about re regrets. I was so depressed and stuck on not having a career. And I was so like, you know, what kind of attitude is that? To be mm. like, oh, I'm so, so above it. You know, <laughs> radio's dead now. Yeah. You know, I should have adapted. I wish I'd done that sooner. But then I, once I started to find myself a little bit and get confident in what I'm doing, 
And the Schmoes helped me do that and doing the news, which was just the same thing I was doing in 1995, 96 on the radio. And I just felt then I then then I think I became a different person and a little bit more of my not final form because we're always growing. Well, yeah. But I became a better form. The person at 35, the people who knew me in my 20s who I lost contact with mm -hmm. would come back in my life about 35, 36 range or even now. And they're like, who are you? You're a completely different person from 10 years ago? Yeah. Yeah? In, in the sense of, I'd say a little bit more. Mm -hmm. 30, 31 is when I, I got in a real oh. serious relationship with a great girl. And that mm -hmm. was a good relationship. Taught me a lot of things. And, and but that, that range on. My mid-20s friends, a lot of my mm -hmm. work friends. Yeah, yeah. Who are, who are police officers now. I know, I know three people in the SWAT team, LAPD. And uh, friends are detectives and watch commanders. And uh, one of my friends is actually a senator now, uh, Steve Knight. Um, and uh, a lot of those people. Like, have, have they, they, they wouldn't, they are like, who are you? They wouldn't recognize you really. Like, yeah. I was the guy, we'd go to Chili's in Northridge. <laughs> it's over by CSUN. Yeah, yeah. You know that Chili's it's on Reseda? still there? It's still there. <laughs> yeah. The it's one by, uh. Reseda. And there's, uh, there's, Carl, there's, there's Carl's Jr.'s across the street. The area's changed around it. Yeah. There's like a, like a Acapulco like next to it now. Yeah. Just up the street. Yeah, go, yeah. I go to the Acapulco a lot too. Maybe <laughs> I ran into you there. I'd go, me and my friends would go to that Chili's. Um every monday at five o'clock uh -huh. to the point where when we walk in the waitress had our drinks waiting for us yeah soda for me um <laughs> at the time and i couldn't look the waitresses in the eyes to order you're too i was scared. so scared yeah, yeah. Of talking to a real live human uh -huh. woman um they'd come up hey what are you guys hey good to see you guys there's one waitress her name was stephanie and i started to like her turned out she was a lesbian no <laughs> sounds like a joke a sketch or a kevin smith movie but yeah, it, yeah. she i was really comfortable with her my friend's like you should ask me out or ask her out yeah, and yeah. i went i went to a mutual friend who had a a friend who worked at chili's and i was like hey what's up with stephanie and they're like oh she's a lesbian i was like that's about right <laughs> um that's how it turns that's out that's how it works out yeah, yeah. but i couldn't look these waitresses in the eye i would start sweating twitching and my friends would make fun of me in front of the waitresses oh yeah like what's wrong with you and just make it worse look her in the eye yeah, yeah. start talking to and so those friends uh -huh. when they see me now not the performance side because i was always doing the performing thing yeah, but yeah. socially oh. um and just how i've just i'm just a calmer person now and that comes from confidence and it comes back to that thing of at some point it was like i, I went to therapy and i suggest people go to therapy i didn't take medicine but if that's possible and it's it's recommended you know i'll do it i'm not against that at oh. all uh um, well you never tr you never tried to take the, the no, pills? no my, my my therapist wanted to give me pills but uh -huh. i didn't want to do it well, um because you feel like it, I, I felt I... like i had it in me to change oh, okay and i said let me go let me do one final thing because i'm not leaving stuff on the table you know mm. what i mean i'm not giving blood on the I'm not, there's no blood on the tracks i'm not giving my all to uh -huh. this recovery mm. so in my 33 range 33 uh -huh. to 35 is when i was like again and, and I want people to not misunderstand me. I was depressed. Mm. It was serious. I was going to deal with it. But at the same time, shut the F up. Yeah. And quit making yourself yeah. feel like this. Yeah. And feel like it to other people. Mm -hmm. So so that's when you started going to therapy? And that then, was when I had, had out oh, of therapy. Oh, that was after therapy. But you, after. Said, you said you did five years of therapy? Five or was that years, a joke? F no, no. I was five, yeah, that's, that's true. Okay. So the, what late twenties. What, what were the first things you talked about in therapy? It was like uh self worth, mm. realizing your parents are humans and not to blame I don't blame them for anything. Mm. You know, I don't blame them for anything at all. A lot of it comes from them. Mm. Um my mom can be a little finicky and melodramatic. My dad can be sullen and depressed. I'm both of them. <laughs> um, you know, so forgiving them and just and just finding you know it was a process it's a long process was, a lot of anger a lot of tears was it like kind of like philosophical like what am i doing with my life what am i why am i here there was a lot about that but also finding worth because i chose i chose a career path and i still have a career path collider shuts down tomorrow what do i do what do i do yeah who am i yeah what's my worth what are you worth yeah and you know i'm, I'm riding a high right now and my Twitter followers are growing and yay. And I have shows and I, you know, today my job is to talk about Star Wars yeah. and wait for you to show up. That was my job today. Yeah. And I read a Star Wars book because we have to review it. And I sat on a couch for an hour. Now, mind you, we have tremendously busy days here, as you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, this was just meetings. A, the, meetings. We, yeah. This was a lighter. I don't want anyone. I, I hate it when people are like, uh, what do you guys have? Nothing, nothing, no, you just all this free time at Collider. Yeah. Oh, Trust me, it's not a it's not a YouTube channel run in a bedroom. It's a yeah, company. You guys are. But today living... was today was a light day. A uh -huh. Jedi Council at Inside Schmodown, and I was waiting for you. Literally, that was my day today. And 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 by the way, Beardo came early, guys. I'm saying I had a couple hours. No, no, yeah, I was. I uh, thought I was like I could have came earlier. No, 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 no. You're good. You're good. Oh, yeah. Um, and uh, and and uh, 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 
this is kind of a career though that again it all goes away so what's myself worth and i was struggling with that because back then i wanted to be a writer more mm -hmm. screenwriter wanted to be a stand-up comic i was i mean i was a stand-up comic but i wanted to be a successful one mm. and it's like you if, if you're getting your worth from that you'll have no worth because this isn't and this is what my ther therapist would tell me like if you wanted to be a police officer Mm -hmm. You go through backgrounds, you go through processing, you get hired, you go to the police academy. If you survive that, you get on the job, then you get promoted. And there is a plain on paper uh, path to you're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. Like you did it. Acting, stand up, writing. Yeah. One day, you know, I talk to the people around here who go to auditions. Talk to, to Grace Hancock, you know. She doesn't know. Every audition she goes to, and she goes to a lot that one could be the one that changes her life yeah or it could be one of 300 that she doesn't get mm -hmm. and it's so if that's your only f sense of worth you're gonna fail all the time you're not gonna have worth and you're gonna be depressed so in my 20s i had no sense of worth so, like uh like you you just didn't know who you were you're just like I mean, what am i, I doing I've, I've always been the same like i've always been this sarcastic dennis miller like yeah yeah you know grumpy guy yeah um that's not that's a character at times on schmoes mm -hmm. uh um, but, is that a character you always say like I'm, I'm grumpy I, I don't get women I, I I do that yeah that's an interesting thing I don't get women but uh -huh. I do you know what I mean <laughs> like, but what? a lot of times it's not a lie like, like you like you I actually just don't a, get women I went through two, a two year period of of next to nothing you know what I mean like I don't date yeah I have never been on a date I've never said hello young lady I'd like to declare my attentions would you like to go for a milkshake so, so um, how do you approach a woman how do you how I've do always you... become friends with them all my yeah. relationships have come out of friendships as opposed to what going to a bar and saying hey let me go to buy a bar drink. or a dating service or you know or even I've I've had you know, uh, I've had uh, people be like, hey, you know, Nick Mundy, God bless him, used to be like, hey, you know, my wife's got a friend and she's she's single and would you want to go on a date? And I was like, no. <laughs> so why, no, why, she's really hot. I don't don't care. Why would you say no? What, what, what was your reasoning behind uh, that? Fear again, self-esteem. Yeah. I also got to a point, I was so alone in my 20s. Mm. And then I back to back to back had three relationships over the course of 10 years. Wow. And that ended about 38. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm 41 now, that's about three years ago. Mm -hmm. And when I reemerged, I thought, well, fine. Like, I, again, back-to-back -back relationships, pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I thought, great, it's good. I know, I know my way around women. I'm going to be okay. In the 20s, I didn't know. And I, yeah, yeah. You know, and I famously said on Makuga's show, it's 100% fact. I didn't have sex when I was 28. Wow. I was so socially awkward, so raised to believe a certain way, so trapped by a lot of things. I didn't have sex when I was 28. Was it the Christian thing where you're like, hey, I can't yeah, do that, it until I'm married? That started it. Oh, okay. That was it till my early 20s. Uh-huh. I held on to it. And not that I 100% believed it in that sense, but it was like, all right, this is the thing I got to do. And yeah. then we moved to LA. You don't think that. No. And then it was, oh no, I don't, I don't know my way around women figuratively and literally, but. And well, you then, can't make eye contact with them. Then man. I can't make eye contact with them. Yeah. And it, and, and that, that's why that movie 40 year old virgin is a documentary to me when you're <laughs> like, how did that happen? He's like, it just did. And I thought I was like, oh boy, I'm, I'm, this is never going to happen. Uh -huh. Then suddenly out of the blue, 28, I get a girlfriend, horrible relationship, two and a half months. Right after that, there's a little period of downtime. And then I uh, ended up dating a, a girl I knew through my job at the farmer's market in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. I'd switched jobs at the time, became a security director over there. And out of that, ended up in another relationship. Mm -hmm. And that one lasted f overall five years, two actual solid years. And then we kind of lingered for three years. Uh -huh. Um, but it was, it was a great time. We're still friends. And I emerged from that three years ago and mm -hmm. thought, cool, I've got this down. Yeah. I'm confident. I can go to Chili's and I can talk to waitresses. I can go out with Mark Ellis and get drunk on the comedy, comedy store patio. I've had successful relationships. They didn't end bad. They ended for different reasons, life reasons. Mm -hmm. I'm still friends with these women and, and, you know, not a day to day. Hey, how you doing? But like, we're still friendly. Mm -hmm. They're both married now, but they both credit me with a lot of change in their life. And I credit them with a lot of change in, in their life. So I don't have a negative feeling towards them. I'm like, I got this. I'm going to hit the dating scene. I'm the pit boss. <laughs> this is good. And then I suddenly realized I was the same person. And I, I had this fear that I was the same person I was in my 20s. You just re regressed back to and that. And I collapsed back into it. Whoa. And then I was still working at the time, working at this job. Uh, I was back at, at Northridge. Mm -hmm. And I had a great, it was a great job, security director. Mm -hmm. And uh, director of public safety for Northridge Fashion Center. Suit and tie, most money I was making in my life. Managing 55 people, having fun at times. But, but it wasn't the job I wanted. And what, it wasn't the job to get girls necessarily? Oh, no, no. That's yeah. where I met my 
No, that's where I met. Oh no, trust what, me. What my you, my you... employees, my young, my young employees who uh, were college age dudes. Uh, you can make fun of security uniforms all you want. Those security, those uniforms still work. Oh, okay. I had a lot of guys. No, we had problems. Uh, security guards get a lot of women. Uh, <laughs> trust me. Uh, I had problems with it with my employees. I just stopped them doing it on the job, you know? Uh, um, but no, no, it wasn't that. It was just, it was, wasn't the career I wanted. And I, 17 years in this career, I was like, oh, I'm not getting what I, my life did not go the way it turned out. Mm-hmm. So when I got out of this relationship and found it still difficult to talk to women, uh-huh. still difficult to ask women out on dates, still w- uh, finding situations where I was fi- getting crushes on women that you know didn't see me that way, which is again totally fine. There that they have that choice. Um, being but, being Sir Jorah from Game of Thrones, um, <laughs> the friend zone, and being in this horrible job that I that mm-hmm. you know in my mind a horrible job that I hated, while everyone else was you know, successful YouTubers and comics and not, not again, I can't say not a job. I've never been jealous of like, you know, Christian Harloff and Mark Ellis Schmoes. No, I was like, good for them. They took that chance and started it, mm. but I, I, I didn't do it. And I have regret for not doing it. And so I was lost and I got, and depression returned. Mm. And so for the last couple of years, when I go on Schmoes and say, uh, I don't get any, get any women. Yeah. Um, that's a hundred percent true. Other than every once in a while, you know, uh, hundred <laughs> percent the... true in that yeah, yeah. sense. And people, it, you know, they see me out at Comic Con, and I've I got pictures with Roxy Stryer. I got pictures with Alicia Malone, Maude Garrett, Michelle Boyd, wonderful, beautiful, vivacious women. Yeah. And people are like, "What? Pit Boss has always got women yeah. around him." Yeah. Michelle Boyd's in a long term relationship. <laughs> Roxy's in a long term relationship. Maude and I are friends. Alicia and I are friends. Always yeah. have been. And so people and then alicia calls me out on drunk movie fights yeah and says you know you're you're, you're full of shit. you're full in it you're yeah, full yeah. of it because you you you're always women love you and the truth is a lot of these women probably are f- big fans of me and there's probably secret admirers that i didn't know all this stuff but i was so looking in on myself again because again depression is ego is, is self-centric it's egocentric uh-huh. so depression when you're depressed and i got really depressed in 2015 mm-hmm. um because again i was putting my self-worth elsewhere so then what happened is this big change happens and I go to Screen Junkies and I finally, after 17 years, leave my day job. Mm. And my day job was bad at the end. Like it was, times were changing. Um, I had, I, f- you know, fought a dude with a knife. I did not have oh. the knife. He had the knife. We, one time there was a woman who was um, threatening. She got busted for a theft and uh. JC Penny called for backup and we go out there and she was like trying to bite everyone because she had HIV. Ooh. And while we were, four men trying to re- not get bit by this woman and tackling her and handcuffing her. People were videotaping us and putting it up on YouTube and stuff. And it's like that. And that's why I have a real not popular opinion on the local, on, mm. on, on the national the, uh, anti-police atmosphere. Uh-huh. Um, Cause I've had a video camera in my face while I was holding down a woman with HIV trying to bite me yeah. and people wanted me in trouble. Yeah. And so I, I had, my job was getting really well. I wanted out of it. So I get out of it mm-hmm. and I get, Good job with screen junkies and you would have thought that's great yeah the most depression i've had in 15 years set in almost three weeks into the job because i thought my worth was going to come from that wait was oh it's, oh it started right when you got the job yeah so then when you i was already depressed but then yeah. i got out uh-huh. and it's like i was it was an emotional experience 17 years imagine uh-huh. 17 years your whole time you're like you want, i want out of prison yeah, yeah i want out of prison and you get out of prison you're like no. I'm still the person I was. Yeah, yeah. And so no problem with, with Screen Junkies. People kind of, I get asked all the time, uh-huh. why did you leave Screen Junkies? Why'd you leave Defy? And on the surface, there's a lot of answers. Collider was my friends, was made up mostly of my friends. Um, John Campy was very supportive with the idea of bringing me over. I didn't really know John, but John was like, I love what you do. Let's come over. Dennis, let's come over. I didn't know Dennis, uh-huh. but Christian and Mark and Mark Riley and McCuga were all here. It was like, let's go be with friends. Um, that and closer to home. That's on surface the reason I left, but deep down, no fault of anyone at Screen Junkies. The moment, oh, again, three weeks into the job, I realized, oh, this is still a job, fun yeah. job, Yeah. but I'm going home depressed. I'm going home alone. I'm going home with no self-worth because I put, I again, fell for the trick. I mm. fell for that trick. If I get out of the mall and I'm not a, a director of security, my life will be better. Uh huh. And then it wasn't. And it spun me into the worst depression I've had since my mid-20s. Whoa. So you get disillusioned. You think, 
you think this is it. This is what yeah. it's going to, this is going to fix everything. And then, and then you see that it does not yeah. Then you have a bad day at work mm. and then, you know, it's, you know, again, it's work. Yeah. You know, driving an hour to Beverly Hills. Again, these are privileged problems. Yeah. See, someone can see, someone can be listening links. Hey, Ken, what the fuck? Yeah. Yeah. Like, no, exactly. And you I have get a it. job in Beverly Hills they're, with screen junkies. They're privileged problems. Yeah, yeah. Totally understand. But guess what? They're my problem. <laughs> yeah. And guess what? It's real. And then, so you drive there and again, and that's, but, but here's the thing, Bird, that's part of the problem too, is I'd be driving home mm. going, why am I sad? Yeah. I've got this great gig, got this great opportunity and I still feel horrible. Now, still feel empty? Still feel empty. Still, uh -huh. I'm going home alone. Uh -huh. I can't get women. I can't talk to women. Do I, then do I even want, maybe I don't want a relationship. I'm going to die alone. And then I wasn't getting airtime. I wasn't, I was hired to be a producer mm. and I felt, uh, I felt I should be on air more. And then it's like, this kind of stuff wasn't happening. And I was driving home, but then I'm like, ah, but I shouldn't complain. Yeah. And so I think it's on some head, on some levels, it's true. At some level, it's true. You shouldn't complain. Um, but you know, I worked a job for 17 years that's a national punchline where I couldn't walk around doing my job, even if I was in a suit and tie, uh -huh. walking next to an armed canine unit. Uh -huh. I'd still get made fun of. Oh, I've had soccer moms pull over their cars to point and laugh at me because they watch some stupid Kevin James movie and they don't realize that I've had a person die in my arms. They don't realize mm -hmm. that I fought every gang member uh, group in LA. They don't remember, you know, they, you can't arrest anybody. I've arrested over a hundred people. You know what I mean? Like they mm -hmm. don't, so they don't get my job. They didn't. It's, it's a really important job that's treated crappy even by the people who pay us. Yeah. Mall ownerships across the world should up the pay and, and get higher qualified people in there because I'm the first responder. Yeah. You know, me and my guys, I've handled more 25 bomb threats <laughs> before LAPD even showed up because I had to go confirm whether the device was worthy enough to call. You know, so I have this whole job. So I got tied up in all that. And then I got, get out of that. Uh -huh. and, and I still feel crappy. <laughs> Because I'm helping the guys behind honest trailers. Yeah, yeah. And I and so it's it it. But the whole time I'm saying I shouldn't complain. And I think when you say I shouldn't complain too much, sometimes it's right. It goes back. I don't. I'm not counteracting what I said earlier. Because uh -huh. sometimes it sh I should have slapped myself in that. And, and uh, Christian Harloff used to tell me, just stop. Who is this person? Yeah. yeah. You have an opportunity of screen junkies. I helped get you this opportunity. Slap yourself upside the head and get it. He's right. He's 100 percent right. Mm -hmm. But I got so wrapped up. It's so wrapped up in it. It's it's like why am I not happy? Why am I not happy? And and I'm complaining, and that just makes it worse. Yes. Yeah. Yes. We become our own worst enemies. If but you it, keep but complaining. You're just feeding yourself. <laughs> you're feeding your own depression. It, yeah. And but it, you you think it is that chemical thing? I think it starts. That's why it's a bit of a disadvantage. That's uh -huh. why I want to make. I'm going to say this 20 times, Beardo, uh -huh. to anyone listening. Uh -huh. if, if we deal with depression, it's serious and should be taken serious. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, look yourself in the mirror sometimes. And uh -huh. I, I needed, with screen junkies, I needed to look myself in the mirror and be like, mm. I have, I should, I should stop rapping. Because after, after a while, I slipped off the slope and it was nothing. Because then I did get on air. Yeah. Then I did have Watching Thrones. And then Andy was putting me on stuff. And then I was getting popular. And then drunk movie fights. And I was yeah. going to conventions. And I was having a great time. And believe me, all that stuff's great. And I made great connections with Dan and Joe and Spencer. The guys are great. Uh, and a lot of the behind the scenes people. But um, Were you still feeling empty at I that I was still feeling empty because really? once you slip off that slope, uh -huh. you get to a point where nothing. Nothing makes like, you happy? I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Here's, here's pizza. Nope. I didn't want pizza. I wanted steak. Here's uh -huh. steak. No, I'm still hungry. I came too late. I didn't want this now. I wanted this. I wanted steak 10 years ago. Mm. And you, you, once you fall down the slope, it's hard to climb. You, you need help climbing back up. So how did you get that help climbing back up? Um, I, got, I got lucky with the collider job. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, I think I ran away a little bit. I think if I dug in, I would have been, would have, I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the situation. Uh, again, there's nothing negative at Screen Junkies, but if, like, if I, if I had got, slapped myself upside the f head and like, uh, you know, I, there's a lot of cool things going on at the fine Screen Junkies, yeah. I, I would have been fine. Mm -hmm. But I got this opportunity with Collider mm. and it just kind of was a good time to, to get some fresh air, mm -hmm. start over and go, all right, I'm not leaving the mall. Yeah. There's not pressure to make this replace give me my self-worth because I left my day job. I've left my second job. Uh -huh. I, I worked, again, 17 years. The only time I worked, I changed companies was when the contract changed. Yeah. I worked for the same, basically the same company for 17 years. And suddenly now, 18 months in, I'm switching jobs. It was a weird thing for me. Mm. It's real tough for me. You don't like change. I don't like change. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I don't like saving money. I don't like change, Beardo. <laughs> and when Harloff called me and said, hey, we can make this happen. 
It was kind of sudden. Mm-hmm. It was like, oh gosh, this is a thing. Do I want to do this? Was your first instinct no? First instinct was no. Yeah. Well, what was the reason behind it? Like uh, change. Even th- but even though you like, you didn't. Uh, even though I wasn't enjoying my time at Screen Junkies. Yeah. Again, yeah. I, I hate saying that publicly. Yeah. Joy, I made the mistake. I was treating myself badly there. I could have enjoyed it a lot more. It's um, in your head. It's that in you my didn't... head. Yeah. And and. I needed that. And so I got the opportunity. It was like, all right. It was like, literally I'm driving with, from Defy mm-hmm. with boxes in my car, gonna go start a couple of days later at Collider. Uh-huh. And I was like, we're gonna do this better. What do you do? What better? Myself in this job better. Meaning like a better outlook, a better outlook. Okay. And look, we've had our moments here. Uh-huh. Christian's had to pull me aside here and be like, you're doing it again. <laughs> oh, um, so you do slip back into that uh, yes, mindset. And, and that goes back to where I talk about chemicals and uh-huh. depression's always going to be a thing. Mm. It's always going to be a thing. I'm going to have to wake up every day and choose not to be depressed. But with your situation, it's, it's kind of weird because you don't like change, but you get bored easily. Is that yeah, fair yeah. To so say? I get stuck. It's it's hundred percent fair to say. Uh-huh. I get I I have about a three year mark. Uh-huh. Where I'm involved with things for about three years, and I get tired. You get you get sick of it or get, bored or just or... like not stimulated by it anymore. But then the security job you're with for seventeen years. For seventeen years. So yes. so were, were you with that for so long because you're good at it or I was I, I was good at it. I actually was the first non retired police officer to hold my job at that department at that mall. Uh-huh. Uh, I was actually really good at it. So um, that's why you stayed it because it's a political job too. Because you know I would meet with. Mayor Antonio Villaraigosa knew me by not name but face. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, I knew pol- uh, Chief Bratton. I knew like I, it's a political thing, and and you you know it, the malls are tiny cities, mm. and so you're a part of a city. So a city councilman, if, who, if for us it was uh, Hal Bernson and then Greg Smith and then Mitch Englander, Councilman Englander, um, uh, like they're a big part of their district. So we had, so I was in these meetings. I was this, I was that. I was head of committees and I also was good at it. So you're good and were you having a good time with it? No, no, because oh. I I thought, and I had some people like, and I, I almost quit, and in and, and May of 2015, I think I've mentioned this before in Schmoes, I almost quit it all. Yeah. And moved back home. Um, well, you almost gave gave up the whole everything uh, LA thing. And I went home, I secretly went home, well, not secretly, I went home, mm-hmm. but I was secretly surveying the land and yeah. thinking, all right, where would I get my apartment? What would my job be? What could I do? Yeah. I just so happened to run on a friend of mine named Chris, who's a junior high friend, and, and he lives in D.C. now with his wife. And every, it's so weird. We run into each other at these weird times in our lives. And he mm-hmm. was back in town. Unfortunately, his dad was in the process of, of dying and passing away. Mm-hmm. Um, and we ended up staying up till three in the morning one night at his family's, like a, a house that they just all shared. It was, it was just me and him in his house, hanging out till three in the morning, drinking some, some bourbon. Mm-hmm. And, he, and my friend Matt was there too, my old radio partner. And I was going, I'm thinking to move home. And he's the one who was like, slap me upside the head at that moment uh-huh. and could that cause me and, and i tell the story like uh i was like i'm gonna move home and he's like so what so your problem is you you have a a, a high-ranking management job uh-huh. forget the field you have a high-ranking management job you podcast with your friends in your free time mm-hmm. you have a following with that maybe one day you'll make money from it what's wrong with that yeah and i was like oh yeah what's wrong with that like what do you want yeah what do you think you're still gonna be on saturday Night live you still think what, what do you what do you want yeah yeah I was like, you're right. That's fine. And I went back down to LA and a week later, Christian called me and said, Hey, Andy, Andy Signor is going to, Andy Signor is going to call you and we're going to hire you at Screen Junkies. Mm. So I was like, Oh, mindset. Yeah. Mindset. Outlook on everything. Outlook on everything. It's not necessarily the secret. Mm. It's not, you put these vibes into the world, but at the same time, I mean, how many those people do you know when they walk in the room, you're like, Oh, this guy's never going to stop complaining. (laughs) Yeah. Then I don't don't want to be that guy. And you don't want to be around that guy. Right. And so or, on air, I still might be it. Uh-huh. And that's why it cre- the, 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 there was a situation, there was a time, and I finally addressed it on Schmoes, where I was saying, I'm such a lonely guy. Mm-hmm. And I was driving home and having sex with my girlfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, but I had to keep that relationship secret for other reasons because there was a, a, an ex-husband situation and, and mm-hmm. just some stuff. And so we had we, five years, it was a secret thing. Wow. And that was tough. Uh-huh. And part of the reason it didn't last. Um but yeah, so so we're, on air, I, I don't mind being the grouchy guy. But when yeah, yeah. I'm too grouchy off air, uh, I don't like myself. Yeah. So when you are in a relationship and you have a steady job, is mm-hmm. does that complete you in a sense? I don't need relationships to be complete for sure. Um, but you, I'm but I'm not a dater. Uh-huh. Again, I've had friends. God bless Roca, man. That guy. 
They'll tell me, I got five dates this weekend. How do you, what? Why? I've had one, you know, <laughs> half date my entire life. I didn't even know I was on the date. Yeah, yeah. Um, I am, uh, once I, I only get, that's why I, 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 I'm, your, I'm your friend first. Yeah. And the next thing you know, I'm like cuddling up next to you because I'm Sir Jora. And then, you know, most of them fly off on their dragons, but every once in a while they're like, yeah, come into my tent. <laughs> and so uh, that's how I get relationships. So I'm not, I don't need a relationship to feel complete. Like mm -hmm. I could have been fine still being alone. Mm -hmm. um, but once I'm in them, it's warm and cozy. Mm. So, so then what, what do you feel like completes you? What like fulfills you as a person? Oh, well, that's a good question. Uh, good question. Chips and salsa and a good nap. That's all. That's all it takes. Yeah. But then, yeah. And then afterwards, you slip back uh, into a depression. No. Nah, yeah. You know, if I'm not, if I'm idle for too long, I get depressed. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. It's it's a, it's a double edged sword. Yeah. Um, I love. I'm one of the hardest workers because eventually I want to get to the point where I don't have to work. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of people are like that. What fulfills me? You know, right now it's just it's just um enjoying life mm -hmm. that's what i've learned i have a lot of career goals i'd love to you know get paid more for podcasting i'd love to you know you know radio's dead but i'd love to have a daily show somewhere yeah um that would be good i get paid to talk about game of thrones and star wars that's all fine um but i am complete by knowing i can i'm i'm surviving and managing my depression every day and just simple things and we'll see where the rest goes because i don't save money i'm gonna have to have a walmart <laughs> job at 90. <laughs> You don't say money on the four hundred one k. You don't have the whole thing. I do have a four hundred one k. I have like the point two percent, and like I don't. Like, yeah, why do you, why I'm do you, working on that. Why do you think that you don't save anything? You don't think like you don't think long term. Uh, I, I, you know what? I get it from my family too. My yeah. my uncle, my late uncle, retired at forty eight. My dad, huh. a couple years younger brother, you know, retired normally sixty four. But we, there's where we've been struggling for money our whole lives. My uncle was like, I invested, I did this, and poof, I cashed out. Huh. And he would tell me, he and I, before he passed away, we, he lived in Eagle Rock. We became good friends. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, you know uncles but you know you know you have to be kind of family is family but then you kind of really get to know him and and um he would tell me he's like well, i tell your dad invest <laughs> tell your dad follow me and he didn't do it and so i think i pick a little bit up from my family mm -hmm. where they're always struggling for money possibly because they're so worried about losing it I want, losing losing money like i get a ten dollar bill yeah it's like i like I, I shouldn't spend it i don't have enough money yeah, i yeah. didn't have and then one day i buy something for eleven dollars <laughs> So, so it's the fear that causes you to to not yeah, spend it. Yeah, it's initially. that fear where we talked about mm -hmm. it, and 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 uh, um, you know, I guess the foresight. It's that I, I'm getting better. Yeah, and 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 and, and look for years. I make the mistake. I struggled. Uh -huh. I was a seven dollar an hour job. Yeah, you know? so that's yeah. The, Live, it, living in L.A. It's hard. It's mindset where it's like I'm making. I'm not making this money. If I yeah. make this money, then I'll be set. I'll be good. I'll yeah. do this. I'll do that. And then you get to that point. And then yeah, you, yeah, I was making the most. You know, money I've ever made by my my life mm -hmm. at the security job at yeah. that time, not a lot, uh -huh. not, not even six figures, but but uh, cool. I should be all on my own, but I had so much debt. Uh -huh. Not that. See there, look at that. Oh, you're a debt guy. A debt guy. But yeah. even then, I go into it. You know, uh -huh. what I mean, it's like oh, I have so much debt, I can't save. I got to pay this stuff off. Got to pay this stuff off. <laughs> so you come up with these reasons, reasons yeah. and excuses yeah. and everything. You just bring yourself more, even more down. Yeah. And so I recently moved and by myself for the first time, which is a scary proposition in L.A. It's mm -hmm. it's expensive to live here for sure. And I'm doing okay, but it's like even then I'm like, oh, you know, I hope I hope that anchor money comes in. Like I, oh, oh, <laughs> and then my girlfriend even now is like, shut up. Yeah, I wonder if it's like a self sabotaging thing. It is where you just you need that you need that need that feeling of yeah. just like I need to do this. I need to work to yeah. pay this off because yeah. if if I if it was saved, it would be boring. Yeah, if I was paying off, if I was putting this money aside, <laughs> it's pretty boring. Pretty boring. Yeah, yeah, some of that. Yeah. And I'm impulsive, like you said. Oh, you are an impulsive person? Not but, not not like jumping out of airplanes, let's do something crazy, run down the street naked, but like like uh it's like, all right, should I move? Should I move? Should I move? I don't know, I don't know. All right, I got the most expensive place I could find. Because <laughs> so I'm gonna treat myself. Yeah. That's the thing. And then I spend the next few months going, I should have treated myself. I should have treated myself. What am I doing? What am I doing? What am I doing? It's that self sabotaging thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you just you do it to yourself. It gives you a reason to complain. Yeah. 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 I, I like to complain too much, and that's and that. But again, I make it entertaining. Uh huh. But you got to find that balance, and I think over the last few years, I found that balance a little bit more. So you feel like you're in a good place now. I feel I'm in the the best place uh, I've been in a long time. Yeah, yeah. Or on the right path to the best right path. Place. Yeah, right so, path. Yeah. 
I got a I got a job that sometimes sometimes frustrates me. Uh-huh. I know people don't like to hear that. Yeah. Yep. Collider sometimes frustrates me uh, because it's a job. Yeah. Because sometimes I just want to go eat Mexican food at lunch, and <laughs> nope, I got to record Jedi Council. Now I love Jedi Council. Yeah. Why wouldn't I want to be on Jedi Council? Some days I want to go have lunch, Beardo. <laughs> and um, but I, I got a great job mm-hmm. with great things coming here. And uh, I uh, am in a happy relationship that's just started. That's that's low profile. You're not asking me any questions for it. And <laughs> I don't um, want you know, if I could just get back in the gym, Beardo. But no, yeah. uh, no, everything's good. Everything's good, and and it's taken a long time to get to that spot. But that's the thing. The guy listening from Indiana, he said, "If if I can only be on move a, out of Indiana, <laughs> if I can only be on a show where I talk all Star Wars on Jedi mm-hmm. Council, I would be the most happy person." Yep, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> I mean, you might one day get on a show where you're not. We're just talking about Star Wars, but you're not going to be the most happy person. That's not going to do it for you. Is it fun when you know it's a job? Like because like you uh, like talking, you like talking about Star Wars like off air whenever you want, but when you have to I'll, appear, yeah. Uh, and, Here, here's the best. Well, I'll explain it. Like I, I love it. Like we had a great Jedi Council today. I loved it. We talked about those new pictures in the Force Awakens. It was great. I loved it. Yeah. Um, I do the you know me, Dennis, Rachel, and John. We do Thrones talk. But here's here's the example. Uh-huh. So Thrones talk. Uh, well, now we call it Thrones talk. Last year was just the Collider Game of Thrones recap show, whatever. I was obviously at Screen Junkies. Uh-huh. They did it on Sunday nights mm. live right after the episode. Yeah. Um, when that was when I came over here, it was like you're going to be our host of our Game of Thrones show. That was like an, in my deal, you know. And I was like, cool. Um, I'm not doing it on Sunday night. <laughs> I'm like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, yeah. that's my day off. Yeah. I'm not working on Sunday night. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's the Game of Thrones, and we get the most views. Another host, sh- you sh- shall you find, because uh-huh. I don't want to work on Sunday nights. That's a day off for me. But it so seems like t- the dream job, though. But that's what I'm saying. Yeah. It's still a job. Yeah. So I love Game of Thrones. So I don't want my job to ruin Game of Thrones for mm, me. Yeah. Um, I still want to enjoy it. It's a weird career. Mm-hmm. Different. And I, I've never been a working for the weekend guy. Mm. Like, I don't like the nine to five. I'm going to take the boat on the lake on the weekends, but that's kind of what life is. Yeah. So yeah, so I'm very protective, but also I have other things to do. I have the knapsack files of the four center podcast feed, mm-hmm. you know, most every other Saturday or Sunday, me, Scrimshaw and Landa get together and record for six hours. Wow. That's a work day. Uh-huh. So yeah, that's so I, I say that as an example, when you say, does your job change? Once the enjoyment? there's money. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it does change. Uh-huh. It does change where there's some days. And then what I, what I feel bad about is I'll, some people, Come around the schmodown. We got a lot of people on Fridays when we tape. We'll come down and watch the schmodown and their fans. And, yeah, and they do. They have their own shows and everything. But they're here, and they'll, they'll come up to me and they'll be like, "Oh man, what'd you think about that Star Wars thing?" And it's like, I don't want to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to talk about it. You talked about it for two hours. I got work to do. <laughs> yeah. I got some pizza I want to eat here. I need yeah. to go in my office and uh-huh. write. And I feel bad because then I come off as a little grumpy or something. But it's yeah. like, I, no. Yeah. I'll be at parties. Man, what are your top five action stars? <laughs> don't care. <laughs> That's my job. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's where I think it's, I try to be honest and explain it to people, uh-huh. but I feel then it just becomes as, as a privileged a-hole complaining about yeah, it, yeah. but you, you, you'll you only understand if you get in that position. Yeah. I wonder if like, if you were able to do the Knapsack Files or Force Center full time, will it ruin the fun in that? Um, It already does. I mean, <laughs> I mean, that sounds, that sounds negative, but like, you know, but you're a negative person. I have to. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> but you look at you. You're you're here on your own time. Uh huh. You you drove all the way out here to Collider to to interview me, and uh-huh. I'm, and I'm respectful of that. All the joking aside, um, you know, uh, you know, you're putting your time and your passion into this. Yeah, I don't get paid for that. I don't I'm get just, paid for just this. Doing it. Yeah. Um, for Knapsack Files, I have a Patreon now. You guys can support me if you want, but uh, I didn't have that for most of this run. I've been four years doing it losing money Mm -hmm. because you have to pay for hosting yeah yeah. potomatic is not free yeah um and the more successful your show is the more you have to pay the bandwidth bandwidth yeah yeah. um so i love once i get the mics on and that's where i know i'm in the right field though Mm. same thing at work i can complain i want to go up to don cuckoo's here and have some chips and salsa but the moment the mics start and christian mark and perry and i are talking star wars i'm happy Mm. that's why i know i'm in the right field Mm. uh other things would be like I'm still unhappy. That's that's another level of knowing you're not in the right job. Um, but yeah, with Knapsack Files and Force Center, like once the mics are on, but yeah, scheduling it. Yeah. I got an interview coming up. Uh, uh, I don't want to say you'll steal them from me, but, um, you know, I got to schedule. Uh-huh. I got to I gotta give up a night yeah. that I'm not going to relax. I'm going to go home from work and go straight into three hours of broadcasting. 
and you know, it's work. It's a business. It's a business. Yeah. And I got to keep it going. And if I stop, I stop. I, when I moved, I stopped, I had to do the, this last month. I just couldn't record. Yeah. Knapsack files went dead for a month. I was terrified of losing, losing money, you know, yeah. and I'm terrified of losing fans and supporters because yeah. you're not putting content out. Didn't you, didn't you stop Knapsack files? Like when you're at screen junkies for two years? I got, uh, I stopped it for close to a year. Oh, okay. Maybe eight months or nine because, uh, I got to a point where I just, I just, I don't, I was depressed. It was the depression. Yeah. It was the depression. I was like, I just didn't care anymore. That's that's where I'm I'm finding myself with this podcast. You're depressed about it? Not depressed. It's like, why why am I doing this? It's it's like if I put it out, I put it out. If not, yeah. is it the end of the world? And what scale am I scale back? Uh huh. And then find yourself and find where you want to go. Yeah. And it's like, do people really care? They care more about like Schmodown. Like look, all these other shows are doing a lot better. Look, you have your fans. Uh -huh. All right, you're a great interviewer. <laughs> Uh, you've made more people cry in your show than I've had on mine. <laughs> and I have fans of my show, the Knapsack Files, who I'm friends with, who will write me, Beardo's just the best. Really? Yeah. You're <laughs> good at this. Thanks. I, 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 look, what it's, it's, we've been recording a lot longer than I told you I wanted to be recording. Oh, shit. Did, it's all right. Do you, do you have to leave? I now? have to leave soon because okay. I have something to get to. Uh -huh. But that's how good, that's how good you're at doing this. So. Uh -huh. You're comfortable and it's fun to talk to you. So you'll find it. You'll find why. Mm -hmm. You'll but it, find the why. It's it's the thing of like the scheduling and the doing this and, and doing the that. Editing, the yeah. gear. You've got the gear. We had a problem with the the, the chords before the show. Yeah. And and by the way, I haven't heard that once. Uh, yeah. Um and that and that that's depressing. I've had my cord <laughs> chords go out before an interview and you got a guest staring at you and you're like, I'm so sorry. This has never happened. <laughs> I've been there too. And then you gotta lug you lug this box around. I don't think people know. You yeah, lug yeah. this box around. You know? Yeah. And it's at the end like and then on if I if a if a guest cancels or something, it's like what, what the fuck am, what the fuck am I doing? Why yeah, am I doing? then you don't have content. And yeah, then Harloff's yeah. like, Where's your content? <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the guys who do uh after after Shmo, Ryan and Jay and the the Shmo Down Rundown, they're doing it out of their heart. Mm -hmm. And I respect that, you know. Uh, Roka and what he's doing with his drive. Um, you know, I respect that. And that that does wear on people. So mm -hmm. you're not alone in that. Yeah. Even I <laughs> This last month, it was like, ah, maybe I just don't do the Napsack Files again and just do Force Center. And that's, uh, Force Center, I'd never stopped. Okay. Um, but, nope, I need, I need Napsack Files is for me. Yeah. You know? What about Schmoes? What about the Schmoes No Show on Wednesday nights? Yeah, what about it? How, how are you with that? Because sometimes you don't have news. Sometimes you, you just yeah, feel like you're not yeah, into yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you that's just like... a little malaise, I'll say. That's, that's been, I've been doing it for so long. I felt, I love doing the news. Um, I used to be... I think Makuga said it best. When the Shmo started, when it picked up and I joined and Makuga and Riley joined and we're 2013 and we're phase three and we're just bebopping along, having fun and yeah. doing it for, for free. Yeah. Um, I would write the news the night before and it would take two to four hours mm -hmm. researching jokes, practicing, getting yeah. it all down. Um, that's, that's hard to keep up, but also I needed it. I needed that outlet. I didn't have anything else. Yeah. Cause other than that, I was a security director. You so didn't have podcasts. I didn't or, have podcasts. Yeah. Either. Then I did get the Napsack files and everything. But then, then that is the byproduct, maybe of, the, and this is speaking truthfully. Then I get at Screen Jockeys, mm. and then I get the Collider, and then I have Force Center, and then I have the Napsack files growing. Force Center is growing. Um, I don't technically, and you know, hear me out. Don't technically need the news anymore. I don't need to have that outlet. Oh, now okay. it's something that I'm either doing. Uh, because it's a quote job or it's something that I just part of habit. Now saying that doesn't mean I don't enjoy doing it, mm -hmm. but I think I've seen fans question my performances sometimes. <laughs> Ken doesn't seem like he's there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause I've had a long day. Yeah. Cause we were on set all day. Cause we were, you know, uh, we were shooting the La La Land sketch with nine cars in a parking lot built for five. Yeah, and hundred we, degree, hundred degree heat. Yeah. And, Again, that sounds like I'm playing. I'm not. I'm not fighting criminals anymore. I'm yeah, not getting yeah. yelled at by soccer moms who think I'm stupid because I have a job they saw Kevin James make fun of. <laughs> um, but then you go rush into a live show, yeah, yeah. often with no food or anything, and this and that, and yeah, your energy's down. It, yeah. The times have changed. It's a little bit of a byproduct. It's why I endorsed Christian taking a hiatus. Yeah, there was much debate going into that of whether or not he should do that. I was like, no. I said we all have taken nights off. Mm -hmm. You never have. Yeah, you need to go find your chi again you know would you ever take a like a three-month break or hiatus yeah i would yeah. absolutely you would I, I i said it on the show 
I, we have created something. The show has changed uh-huh. in, in, in many ways. It never will go back to what it once was, and that's a good thing, mm-hmm. and it'll always be something new, and that's a good thing. I said a joke the other day when I was like, I feel like an old Saturday Night Live cast member that's hung around a couple seasons too long. Yeah. I'm Daryl Hammond being trotted out to do his Clinton impression. Yeah. And when he was a cast member, now he's different. He's, he took over for the late Don Pardo. That's different. Yeah. yeah. But when it was like his 17th you, season, Daryl yeah. Hammond's still back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I have no intention of leaving Schmoes. Uh, this is still what we do. And believe uh-huh. me, I have those fun moments. Uh-huh. Uh, it believe, uh, uh, you know, don't misunderstand me. It's yeah. what I'm going to do every week. But yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm speaking candidly, like you get people, I'm not crying, but I'm getting, I'm, you're admitting, I'm getting to admit this stuff to you. Yeah. There's nights where I'm just like, yeah, I, I, I not into stopped, it. I stopped writing it the night before. Uh-huh. Number one, when it moved from Thursdays and Wednesdays, I would write on Wednesdays. Oh. So it, that was built into my life schedule. So I had something I was doing every Tuesday night. Mm. I, I would go work out with a friend and it was like a thing. It was like I had to go every Tuesday night. So when the show moved to Wednesday, I was like, I'm not writing the news Tuesday. Uh-huh. It's like I'll cram it in a half hour before the show. So now, instead of the four hours, up to four hours, it wasn't always four hours. Sometimes it was an hour and a half, two hours. Now I've got 30 minutes between my workday ending at Collider and the live show. Mm-hmm. That's why I'd, I'd missed a lot of pre-pro meetings. So I was in my office cranking out news scripts. Still writing the jokes. Then the scripts aren't as good. Then the mm-hmm. scripts aren't as researched. Mm-hmm. Then I don't know the story. You know, that's, then that starts that slippery slope. Yeah. So then, then it became telling Christian Mark, there's just going to be some nights I'm not going to do it. Uh, so so when Mark jokes that like, you're ungrateful because... You yes. you take the paycheck and you don't write the news. Like it's it's like a really a logistical thing. It's, it's l- logistical. They get it. I mean, Mark and Christian get it. We've yeah. been we've been at this a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, in a perfect world, I could you know we'd be broadcasting during mm-hmm. the day, or or I'd be writing the news during the day. But I just don't have that time. That's the thing. Like because the show starts at six. Like everyone's yeah. clocking out of here at work. Like it the day's to, over. The show used to start at eight p.m. When I first started, oh, I was well. producing. We we started at ten in the morning. Uh-huh. Then when I started producing, it moved to eight p.m. on Thursday night, specific time. Whoa! So I leave Northridge at five thirty mm-hmm. the night before. I wrote the news for three hours on average, and I'd leave work at five thirty. Get through traffic. Get there at six thirty. We still still had an hour and a half to broadcast. I could eat, get some food. We go to Buffalo Wild Wings and we hear all the stories of B-dubs. Now, I mean, you've been here. You get up, you you are now the one doing it. You're now driving over here. You're yeah. bringing your box of gear. You're setting up out of passion. Yeah. And, you know, you have this outlet and now I'm like, ah, damn it, I, got, I forgot Schmoes tonight. Oh. You know, and I, I don't I don't say it as a disrespect to the brand or, or the Schmoes. It's just, it has changed uh-huh. and I'm okay with the idea of a new generation coming in uh-huh. and it should always I, i've always said mark and christian are the schmoes and it works best when they're there mm-hmm. but adding the emmas and the joels and the t's and the aces and the rb3s and you and everything like once you get past the test and i do legitimately have a little i don't address new people until <laughs> you're past a certain time what's what's that like a few months or a six month months? or so yeah, uh-huh. yeah 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 it's just like i don't like hangers on and bangers on what do you mean? So I don't know if you're just showing up because you're a fan of the show and you want to uh, kind of get in my way because <laughs> this is a work, like, yeah. you know, or are you here to work? Yeah, yeah. And then you're here to work. Cody Hall. Yeah. Copster. JT. All, all who came before yeah. came to work. We're here to put on a show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the yeah. show the show has to go on the show has to go on <laughs> even with grouchy kid yeah but i i just say that too because do you feel like also in movie talk mm-hmm. i feel like that kind of conflicts with schmoes too because you talk all your movie talk in the beginning yeah it was weird when they when the boys got to amc movie talk and they're doing that more regularly there was this thing of do we need to talk about news on schmoes because they're hearing us do the same thing over and over again there's there's been that concern mm-hmm. uh for me i'm not a movie talk as much oh uh i'm like i'm i'm like if this is an nfl team i'm the kicker here <laughs> like they bring me out for schmoes and um game of thrones uh-huh. and brought and hosting schmoda like yeah. i'm not you know everyone knows i don't watch movies as much as everyone everyone knows i just don't have that passion for it as much anymore i used to in the late 90s mm-hmm. i used to see every movie that came out yeah you have a lot of 90s used references to, yeah used to, th- thank you <laughs> thank you online people are starting to say my references are old and maybe they're right um but yeah 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 i don't know what was Wait. i saying uh, I don't you, know. you just lost the passion for movies. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So that's why I call myself a, a kicker here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I come in to kick the field goal, which is yeah. the news. You're like a utility talk game player. Of yeah. Yeah. I'm not the quarterback. <laughs> well, you, well, you do, you do good at what you do. I'm a good kicker. Yeah. yeah. I can kick 55 yarders to win the game. Yeah. yeah. You win the game for everybody. When you, yeah. you're needed, uh, you yeah. show up when you're needed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm always there. I'm on the sidelines. Yeah. yeah. I go to practice. Yeah. 
All right, cool. It's fourth down, 34-yard line. Let's bring in the kicker. Yeah. He's warming up on the yeah, sideline. Warming yeah, warming yeah. up the sideline. And I, I always wanted to be a kicker in the NFL, so that's a perfect analogy for me. And you wanted to be everything. Who didn't want to be everything, man? Uh, I didn't want to be a superhero. No. I didn't, didn't like superheroes. Didn't gravitate to that, but I wanted to be everything I wanted else. to be an astronaut or uh, you were like a police. Police policeman. and fire. Yeah, 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 police and fire early on. Yeah, yeah. First responding, yeah. Mm. Well, yeah. I kept you here long enough. You did keep me here, but I, I think it was, it was, uh, it was uh, pleasant and well worth my time. Yeah. <laughs> I, I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. I absolutely enjoyed it. Bro. Yeah. I kid you. Yeah. I'll, I'll call you Brian. <laughs> I kid you, Brian. Thanks. Because I think you need it. I, I, I need Because it. I think you're pretty sure that you're the best podcast out there on the <laughs> SK Podcast Network. No, I'm not the best. Um, I'm not the most number one. Yeah. Whatever people care about. That's why I got so depressed. Because like, oh, the people care about the Schmodown more than I. They care about Everyone me. cares about the Schmodown more. Yeah. yeah. Everyone cares. <laughs> I've been at I've been at p- bars in Pasadena, uh-huh. and people have run up to me, Schmoda, <laughs> and that's great. We're building a great brand. Yeah, yeah. Don't let the Schmoda depress you. Thanks. Ride the wave with us. I'll, I'll I'll follow along. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for being here. You're you know you're at Ken Napsuck. You have uh, you have a following on uh, yeah. Twitter, and Instagram. I don't know why, but I do. You have the following. You can find me at Schmo's Beardo. And uh, thank you, thank you for being here, man. Thank hey, you. Hey, thank you. Let's get out of here. Let's um, do it. <laughs>